Hello everyone, Xeno What If here. Bring in Season 2 Part 38 of What If the Transformers Were in My Hero Academia. Link in the description of the fanfiction of this What If. A. N. Listen here YouTube. I do not own anything and this is not a scam. Chapter 75, Grimlock, King of the Dinosaurs. Comma dot dot. Flare Up was incredibly suspicious as to what was going on. Right after Itsuka had gotten out of work, she and the Street Action Minicon team had all been called back to base at a moment's notice, and they were told specifically to bring their human companions with them. Once they arrived, they were immediately greeted by Red Alert, Signal Flare, and an injured Windblade. Naturally, the Scout had been concerned about what happened to her best friend, but Red Alert told her not to worry and that she'd be good to go soon. Once her wing was reattached, though, Windblade offered absolutely no real explanation as to how she got the injury. All she said was that she had gotten hurt on a mission which the rest of the bots were still on. The nature of that mission had remained a mystery, though, with none of them offering to tell her, the mini-cons, or even the 1B students themselves about it. Windblade said it was a surprise, with the city speaker making sure that even May kept her lips sealed about it. And, whenever it's Windblade, she sure as scrap doesn't let anything slip when it comes to surprises. Flare Up thought to herself as she walked through the ground bridge. They were currently on their way to whatever this, surprise, of theirs was, having received a message from Optimus just moments ago where he simply said, Autobots, mission accomplished. Windblade had celebrated accordingly, punching the air with excitement while Red and Signal Flare simply nodded in approval. And on that note, Red Alert punched their coordinates into the ground bridge, asking Signal Flare to remain behind and man it while they went ahead to see the results. Is everyone just as confused as I am? Itsuka folded her arms over her chest skeptically. Just what the heck is going on here? Not sure, but I'm kinda over it already. Tetsu grumbled irritably. Seriously, what the heck is this big mission and, surprise, about? Peering over her shoulder, Windblade sent them a simple smile. Don't worry, kids. You won't have to wait much longer. Setsuna rolled her eyes at that. I hope so. Because if this ends up being something lame, I'm not gonna be too happy about it. Indeed. Abara concurred. As much as I hate to say it, I've also grown rather impatient with all of this needless secrecy. Flare Up gave a sigh, but smiled nonetheless to her sister in arms. Fist better be good, Windy. She winked. You're really getting these kids heated. Ah. Don't worry about it, guys. May assured as she skipped through to the other side of the ground bridge next to Red Alert. From what I hear, you guys are gonna love what the bots have in store for us. I'll believe it when I see, W-H-A-A-A-A. Itsuka cut her statement off in utter astonishment as they stepped directly into the bridge of what appeared to be a spaceship, one that was clearly made for Cybertronians given the size of the chairs and monitors. She and her classmates were equally astonished by what they saw, but of course, that went for flare-up as well. H.H. Ha. Huh. Her optics darted across the bridge, bewildered by the very sight as the portal closed behind her. W. What is this? Where the bloody pit are we? But, just then, a powerful laugh cut through the air, causing them all to spin around. Ah ha ha. Well, well, would you look at this. The gang's all here. Windblade. Red Alert and May all beamed happily at the source of the voice while Flare Up couldn't believe it. There, sitting in the captain's chair with the rest of the Autobot team and the 1A students surrounding him, was Grimlock. Gotta say, Flare, for someone so fast, you sure like to find yourself late to the party a lot of the time. The gladiator quipped. Flare Up was completely speechless for a moment, only managing to creakily turn her head to Windblade while pointing a shaky finger at Grimlock. A are you seeing what I'm seeing, love? She finally managed to ask. I is this really happening? Oh, he's real, alright. Windblade assured, grasping her own shoulder while giving it a full rotation. Trust me, I've got the scars to prove it. Windblade. Grimlock waved as he stood from his throne and approached them. Good to see you. Sorry about the wing. I've been told I gave you some pretty heavy damage, you okay? Haha, -ha, I am now, Grim. Windblade is sure as she and Red met him halfway, while Flare was still absolutely flabbergasted. It's great to see you, too, though. So no hard feelings. Grimlock chuckled and placed a hand on her shoulder gratefully. Ha, huh, I'm quite glad to hear that. His visor then met Red alerts as he extended a hand to him. 
And doctor, I owe you an incredible debt. Thank you for reviving me, even if I wasn't in my right mind at the time. Red readily accepted the gesture. Of course, Grimlock. And don't worry, I have a feeling that the asteroid's impact was what scrambled your circuits in the first place. He let out a frustrated huff. HMPH, if we had the proper equipment on this planet, then maybe we would have known that and I could have made the proper repairs. Ah, uh, shoulda, coulda, woulda, as they say. Grimlock waved off. Can't dwell on the, what ifs, you know, especially now that everything's worked out for the best. Once more, he set his sights down to flare up expectantly. Well, I've been standing here for a while and I still haven't received a proper flare up hello. What's gotten into you, lady? If anything, the good natured, harassment, only made flare up smile even wider than usual, her usual giddy giggle escaping her throat as she blinked in and out of sight. When she reappeared, she was up near Grimm's head, hugging him tightly. Ha 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 ha, Grimlock. Ha ha, there it is. Grimlock reciprocated the gesture. It's good to see you, Flair. Ah, likewise. The femme beamed happily. It's been ages, Grim. Where in the name of Vector Sigma have you been all this time? As he let his excitable friend down, Grimlock put a hand behind his head and gave an awkward laugh. Hee hee, well, that's where we get into some, complicated matters. I've been waiting until everyone was here so that I could explain, but, oh. Just then, his attention was drawn down to the floor, where May, the 1B students, and the Street Action Minicon team were all staring up at him in silent awe. Ha, huh, I see that you've brought even more humans. Wasn't expecting that. He approached the group and knelt down before them, lowering his tone to a gentler cadence. Well now, I've already been introduced to all the others, so what are your names? His kind baritone was enough to bring Itsuka back to her senses, clearing her throat to collect herself. Ahem, W well, um, I'm Itsuka Kendo, representative of UA's Class 1B. It is a great honor to meet you, Mr. Grimlock, sir. Ha, huh, no need for formalities, little lady. Just call me Grimlock. Itsuka bowed her head and gestured to her left. All right, of course. And these are my classmates. Hey, Tetsu raised a greeting hand. Name's Tetsu 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 Tetsu. But everyone just calls me Tetsu for short. That managed to get a chuckle out of Grimlock. Hee hee, I can see why. The former gladiator took note of the wild look in Tetsu's eye, as well as the sharp teeth in his crazy hairstyle. Hem, you look fierce, child. I approve. Tetsu's grin increased and he gave a thumbs up. Thanks. That's what I'm going for, ah. But just then, he was pushed at the back by Setsuna, who practically shoved her way onto the scene to flash her own sharp teeth. Hey, hey. I can be fierce too. Just watch. Gura. H hey. What the hell, Tokage? The metal user began struggling against the girl. The heck did this come from? You're hogging all the spotlight. I wanna impress the cool new bot, too. Gah. Both of you, stop. Abara quickly used her vine hair to separate the duo, giving them an accusatory glare. You're making us look bad in front of. Ahahaha. Grimlock couldn't help but laugh at the squabble before him, much to the teen's astonishment. Ha ha ha. Oh, oh boy, I'm sorry, but you have no idea how much seeing that reminds me of my team. You girls with the green hair, what are your names? The girls straightened up and bowed their heads in greeting. Oh, I am Abara Shiyazaki. Still wearing a smile, Setsuna went next. And I'm Setsuna Tokage. And what do you mean we remind you of your team? Hee hee, well, Slug and Snarl would get into arguments like that very often. Grimlock explained as he pointed to Abara. And then Swoop would come in and she'd separate them, chewing them both out in the process. Hey, don't suppose you have a sludge amongst you. The four teens glanced at one another confusedly. Ah, uh, a hey, sludge. Before Setsuna's inquiry could be answered, though, the 1B students quickly found themselves being pushed out of the way by a very excited May. Hello there, the support course student sang. I'm Mei Hatsume, resident inventor and Red's personal assistant. Not too sure who this, sludge, is you're talking about, but after hearing stories about you from the Autobots for so long, I am so, so, so psyched to finally meet you. She took out a pen and paper, prepared to take down many notes. You would not believe how many questions I have for you. After her little ramble, 
Grimlock contemplated the girl that stood before him, only to once again give a mighty guffaw. Ahahaha. Well, it's evident that you're much smarter than he is, but with your level of excitement, I'd say you're fairly close to being sludge. I'll take that as a compliment. May assured as she began writing down her similarities to this, sludge. I'm guessing you must miss your team, huh? Itsuka tilted her head, given how much you're reminded of them. Ha, huh, you're right about that, Itsuka. Primus, I miss them. However, Grimlock raised a determined fist. But it's okay, because I know that I'm definitely gonna find them now with everyone's help. Now that I'm not stuck in the prehistoric age anymore. That made the five teens' eyes widen. The prehistoric age, May uttered in amazement. So you mean you really did walk amongst dinosaurs? Not only did I walk among them, I lived with them. And believe me, I have many stories to tell when it comes to those adventures. Shifting his attention to the mini cons, Grimlock continued on. But first, time to wrap up introductions. Name and rank, little bots. Highwire, Sir Shock and Grinder all immediately straightened up and saluted. Sir. Street action mini con team at your service, sir. The former exclaimed. Highwire. Grinder. And Sir Shock. The team stated in a roll call before Sir Shock went on. Our primary function is information gathering, sir. We can also combine to form a singular being named, Safeguard. That took Grimlock by surprise. A mini-con team that's also a combiner. Ha, huh, don't see too many of those. He saluted back to the little bots all the same. A pleasure to meet all of you. Now, let's catch you all up to speed, shall we? Itsuka rubbed her head, still trying to come to grips with everything. Yes, please, because I'm very confused right now. My first question being, she set her sights straight over to Keita, prompting the rest of her friends to do the same. Why in the world is Kiryu here? The other 1B students did a double take at the Soro Parts user's presence. Uh, yeah, last I checked, you weren't in on the secret. Tetsu said with a suspicious eye. She is now. Mei sang her announcement, only to then pout a little. Even though I didn't get to show off the revised version of my welcome speech. Fei. Whoa, no way. Setsuna's eyes lit up seeing the gray-skinned girl. 1A's Keita Kiryu is in on the secret. That's totally awesome. She practically zipped up to the girl to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Setsuna Tokage. I became a big fan of yours after watching you at the sports festival. Oh oh. Kata stammered, taken aback but no less grateful for her words. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I love dinosaurs, so your quirk was just off the freaking chain to me. Setsuna gushed, though she also gave a slight wince. I would have talked to you sooner, but, I was afraid what Monoma would do if he caught me trying. Kata rolled her eyes at that. Ah, uh, yeah, that guy's a weirdo. How do you handle sharing a class with him? See, that's the thing. Itsuka exclaimed, entering the conversation suddenly. He's pretty much always normal during class, but it's only whenever he's anywhere near one of you 1A guys that he suddenly becomes a creep. She ran her fingers through her hair in frustration. Gah. He's so freaking hard to handle, but enough about that. Placing her hands on her hips, Itsuka tilted her head. My question still stands, how are you suddenly in on the secret? Ha, huh, hey, about that, Kata rubbed her neck awkwardly. I really had no choice in getting in the know about the Autobots, really, on the account that these two digging up Grimlock in the first place. She sidestepped so that they could see her parents, who both waved at them. They being my mom and dad. Hello. Krista greeted cheerily. Pleasure to meet you, Kato added. Always nice to meet more of our girls' schoolmates. The recently arrived teens all waved sheepishly back to the duo, though Setsuna was the outlier in that as her jaw dropped. No, freaking, way. She pointed between Kata and her parents. Why you're related to, those Kiryus. Kata gave an affirming nod, and then Setsuna screamed her head off. Ah, she vanished in a green blur and reappeared in front of the couple who needless to say, were quite surprised. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Why you're Dr. Kato and Professor Krista Kiryu? I am a huge fan of your paleontological findings. Krista's smile widened and she clasped her hands together. Oh, why thank you. It's always nice to meet a fan. Setsuna took off her backpack, pulling out one of her school notebooks and a pen. See can I have your autographs? Of course, Kato accepted readily. Not often we get asked to do this kind of thing. 
As Satsuna bounced up and down like the happiest person on earth, the 1A and 1B students converged on one another, going back to discussing the current situation. So you guys just up and left on a mission without telling US about it. Tetsu crossed his arms, furrowing his brow at a certain boy who he shared similarities with. What the hell, Kirishima? Dude, there was literally no time. Ajiro insisted. We had to get our butts in gear if we wanted to save Grimlock before the wrong people found him. Still, a heads up would have been appreciated. Abara commented. Denki made a counterpoint, well yeah, but then you guys wouldn't have been as surprised. And trust me, he pointed up to Flare Up, who was still absolutely giddy as she high-fived Grimlock. That's the face of someone who was successfully surprised. Abara hummed a little and gave a shrug. Fair point. Though she still raised a questioning brow to Izuku, Kyoka and Momo. But what exactly are you three doing here? Aren't you grounded for the remainder of the week? Hey, Agent Fowler managed to convince our parents to let us come. Izuku said with a sheepish smile. But uh, don't let them know where we really are, okay? Yeah, they're supposed to be at an important Sector 7 meeting. Fowler himself explained with massive air quotes and a smirk. They're not due back until curfew, though, so we've still got a little bit. Checking her phone, Momo's eyes widened a little when she saw the time. Oh, 45 minutes to be exact. We're cutting it pretty close. But Kyoko wasn't too worried. Ah, we'll be fine. We can get this wrapped up in half an hour and be back before ya know it. She craned her head back up to Grimlock. Yo, Grim. Once she had his attention, she raised a hand to him. Now that we're all here, mind filling us in on what exactly happened to ya. Optimus stepped forward, agreeing with the punk rocker. Indeed, I am quite curious myself. How did you get separated from the Ark, Grimlock? And what about the others? RC furthered. Did you see any of them make it? Grimlock didn't respond immediately, remaining silent for a moment or two before ultimately giving a heavy sigh. Ha, huh, I suppose it's time that I give the full story, huh? He craned his head around the room, meeting the optics of his peers. Everyone, you might want to sit down for this, because this isn't a very nice tale. Not one that I tend to like remembering, anyway. He proceeded toward his chair and took a seat, where he peered down to the confused and concerned humans. It is a tale of tragedy, of shame, though one that ultimately has a bittersweet ending. This, is what happened when the Ark crash landed on this planet. ZRKT, oh the humanity. Bumblebee proclaimed, his hands flying up to his head. Not yet. Humans are all but absent from this story. Grimlock corrected, missing the context entirely. Rather, Earth's dominant life forms at the time were, as you're all aware, dinosaurs. Just like that, Setsuna and the Kiryus were all listening quite intently. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Our true starting point is in the upper atmosphere of the planet. After a long time of searching the cosmos, the arcs, energon levels were running dangerously low. So, Alita-1 agreed that we should take to our stasis pods and let the ship go into autopilot for the time being to conserve what energy we had left until we found an energon-rich world. Alita-1, Ochako inquired, tapping her chin. Why does that name sound familiar? Optimus Optics seemed to have a sad glow to them at the mention of that name. I, have mentioned her in the past, Ochako, he elaborated. She is the Ark's captain. He directed his attention right back to Grimlock. You, wouldn't happen to know what became of her, do you, Grimlock? Sadly, the lightning strike commander shook his head. Unfortunately, I do not. Optimus lowered his head, much to Grimlock's chagrin as he continued, and it shames me to say that. Because when the Ark was sucked into the Earth's gravitational pull, of all the bots that TELETRAAN1 could have woken up, it chose me. And in the end, that was the greatest mistake it ever could have made. Comma dot dot. 65 million years ago. BWAM 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 BWAM. Gurr, shut up. Grimlock bellowed as he came online, bashing the door of his stasis pod straight toward the ceiling to smash the blaring alarm. Unfortunately, given the stasis room was filled with set alarms, that didn't really do much to stop the noise. Here he was, thinking that a little stasis nap would help improve his mood, but no, he had to wake up to probably the most annoying sound he had ever heard in his life. G-R-A-A-A-H. What the slag is going on? Warning. Warning. 
Planetary impact. Imminent. Just like that, Grimlock snapped to attention, though he was still plenty angry. Huh. He rushed to the main bridge, and immediately, he was met with the sight of the arc plummeting toward a green and blue planet. Frag. He went to Alita's captain chair, inputting commands as quickly as possible. Gur, Teletron, status report. Why aren't the thrusters working? Energon levels, nearly depleted. All resources are being redirected to navigation systems. Override. Grimlock commanded. Reroute back to engines. Unable to comply. Insufficient energy levels for primary thrusters. Gurah. Grimlock smashed his fists against the armrests of the chair, quickly growing more aggravated. We need to abandon ship, the escape ship. What are its energy levels at? A flash on the screen showed a model of the escape ship, wherein its energy levels were completely in the green. Escape ship fully operational. Grimlock pumped a fist. Ha, huh, excellent. Now all we need to do is wake everyone up and, boom, yard. Just then, the ship was jerked forward, propelling Grimlock all the way across the room, cracking the windscreen in the process. Just then, all of the lights went out, including the holographic display screens, which sent a chill through his systems. T. Teletron. Teletron. Significant damage to outer hull. Main control systems critical. Shut down a minute. Hearing T-E-L-E-T-R-A-A-N-1 go offline, Grimlock's spark sank. Without Teletron, he wouldn't be able to wake everyone up all at once. He whipped his head back and forth between the exit door and the approaching planet, time was running out. He rushed back to the stasis room and whipped his head around, seeing the dozens upon dozens of Autobots that were at risk. Alita, Ironhide, Chromia, Ratchet, Cliffjumper, all very close friends, at least they supposedly were. That was until they left him and his team behind. On that note, he went back to his open pod, and alongside it, was the rest of his team. Right then, at that moment, he knew what he had to do, save the most important ones, to him. The Ark's outer hull can take the re-entry. I'm sure most of the others will be fine. He rationalized as he went over to his team's pods, scanning his visor across Slug, Snarl, Swoop and Sludge's slumbering faces. But, if there's even a chance that I could lose them, after all we've been through, not happening. One by one, he took their pods and began tossing them into the escape ship, intent on getting them all out of there. And, as Fat would have it right as he loaded Sludge's pod in, KR Crack Grimlock whirled around at the disconcerting sound, where he saw a huge crack starting to form in the hull of the stasis room. And it was getting bigger. Scrap. K.R.A. Choom. All at once, the wall was sucked straight out, leaving a massive, gaping hole where the vacuum of space began sucking out everything that wasn't nailed down. And, unfortunately, the closest stasis pods were amongst them. By Grimlock's count, there were about seven or eight that were sent hurtling out, and within he could see the likes of Cliffjumper, Wheeljack, Smokescreen and, was that whirl. Ow. Who cares? Grimlock smashed his hand against the door button and sealed the room. Th those pods are tough, they'll be. Bam. Graw. A sudden impact made Grimlock lurch forward, catching himself on the nearest wall. Once he regained his balance, he spun back toward the escape shuttle, only to see that the launching door had been impacted from outside and cracked open as well, no doubt from more space debris. K.R. Crack Grimlock gasped and sprinted as fast as he could toward the escape ship, K.R. A. Choom, but it was too late. Before his very optics, Grimlock could only watch as the still open escape ship, as well as the recon ship, were pulled out into space and sent careening to the planet below. No. Without even thinking, he dove out after it, speeding through space with every intent on saving his team and... Pow! Triple A ah! Unfortunately, that wouldn't happen. From out of nowhere, a stray meteor clocked Grimlock straight in the chest, blowing him way off course and down to a different area of the planet. Before he slipped into unconsciousness, the last thing he saw was the Ark and the two smaller ships entering the atmosphere, all while he was helpless to do anything. Comma dot dot present day. Needless to say, the room was left incredibly silent after hearing the lightning strike commander recount the harrowing events. All the while, he still hung his head in complete and utter shame. There you have it, Grimlock uttered, bringing a hand to his chest. Because of my act of selfishness, the Ark's re-entry into the planet's atmosphere was a complete and utter disaster. I valued the lives of my team over everyone else on that ship, when I should have held them all in equal regard. Damn. 
Springer folded his arms. You're kind of a jerk there, guy. Springer. Strongarm snapped. That was uncalled for. Bulkhead knocked his friend in the shoulder, and not in the good-natured way. Yeah, not cool, Springs. The triple changer raised his hands defensively. H hey, I'm just calling it like I see it, Bulk. Besides, would you have left anybody behind if you were in that position? Would y'all leave any wrecker behind? Bulkhead went to argue, though the more he thought of it, he couldn't find the correct words to say. Yeah, exactly my point. Springer nudged his chin toward Grimlock. Ya yeah, know, I used to hear some pretty amazing stories about you and your team. Bots kept saying how selfless and awesome you were, but are you sure that wasn't all a lie? Springer, stop. Mina chided, spreading her arms out while placing herself between him and Grimlock. Can't you see he regrets what he did? Optimus approached the wrecker, placing a firm hand on his shoulder to reel him in. I must agree, soldier. Stand down. He locked optics with his subordinate, who narrowed his back at him. You have only heard stories, but the rest of us have all known Grimlock personally. Prime shifted his gaze back to his old friend, who was clearly quite remorseful. Besides, at the time that this happened, I cannot blame him. Tenya tilted his head at that. What do you mean by, at the time, Optimus? The Autobots all exchanged awkward glances at the question, but thankfully, the coolest head in the room answered. It was back when the Ark was almost ready for launch. Jazz said, taking center stage. Prime explained it earlier, but the Lightning Strike Coalition force picked up a strange signal in the Sea of Rust. Where Shockwave was running his experiments, you said. Shoto affirmed. Something about a space bridge. Exactly. Grimlock spoke up again. He was peering to other worlds through the bridges, searching the galaxy for powerful lifeforms he could take inspiration from to create dangerous instruments of destruction for the Decepticon cause. He raised two fingers. Through this project, he created many new sets of bots, the first being us, and the second being the Insecticon Swarm. At that, many in the group felt a chill go up their spin. You, Insecticons. Mina hugged her arms, rubbing them rapidly. I'm getting the heebie-jeebies just thinking about what those could be like. ZRKT, you're right, ZRKT, to be scared. Bumblebee nodded grimly, his memory banks recalling the demise of his close friend, Hot Rod, all too vividly. ZRKT, those varmints, ZRKT, are devilish. Yeah, B's right. Jazz concurred. My buddy, Cliffjumper, and I led a mission into the Sea of Rust to find Grim and his team. He nudged his head toward B, RC and Windblade, all of whom were quite discernibly shaken. These three came along with, plus one other. A bot by the name of Hot Rod. He's not with us anymore. Geez, I'm sorry to hear that. Kyoka expressed her sympathies. RC let out a short sigh. It's, alright. It was a long time ago, and, he went out like a hero. She craned her head back to Grimlock. Hot Rod was pretty concerned about you and your team, Grim. We searched all over Shockwave's installation from top to bottom, if it makes you feel better. The former gladiator's shoulders slumped forward. I appreciate it, RC. But knowing that Hot Rod perished because of me, ha, huh, Primus, I made so many mistakes that day. His anger spiking, Grimlock's visor became red and he reached up to his head, plucking the crown off to throw it. I don't deserve this damned crown. Grim. Grim. Kata exclaimed, rushing right to his side to touch his foot. He snapped his head down, their sights locked onto one another. Calm, everything is calm here. The past is in the past, and there's nothing we can do about it. Thankfully, Grimlock's visor went back to blue and he lowered his arms, kneeling down next to her as he took deep, steady intakes. Ha, ha, I I'm sorry, Kata, but, my mistakes, they, they hurt so much. Well, yeah, the past can hurt. Kata sent him a supportive smile. But look at it this way, you can either run from your mistakes, or learn from them. So, do you think you've learned anything since then, Grim? Slowly but surely, Grimlock nodded back to her. I, I'd like to think so, yes. He stood back up and placed his crown gently on the command console. In fact, I learned much from the dinosaurs that I shared this planet with for well over several decades. When I came to, I was surrounded by several of them, and absolutely none of them wanted anything to do with me. He began listing them off on his fingers, be they three horns, 
long necks, spike tails, big mouths, flyers, or even the dreaded sharp teeth. The teens all eyed one another at the strange name usage, but smiled nonetheless. Uh, hey, we'd classify all of those a lot differently these days. Kato commented. Hmm. But then, I took the time to learn their language. Grimlock went on. And while it took a lot longer to earn their trust, I eventually did so after a cataclysmic event that led to the separation of many herds. He raised a determined fist. It was a massive tremor, but my previous experience lent me the knowledge of knowing exactly what to do. I managed to reunite the herds and led them to a lush valley, which, coincidentally, used to be in the very same valley that we're in right now. Whoa, seriously. Setsuna's eyes glowed in awe. That's so amazing. Haha, ha, yeah, though obviously, it was much different than how it is now. Grimlock chuckled. They referred to it as, the Great Valley, for a reason, after all. The teens couldn't help but marvel at what they were hearing. Whoa, so you really did live among dinosaurs. Tetsu raised an excited fist. That's freaking awesome, man. Krista, however, was just as curious as she was excited to hear about all this. Yes, I agree, but, how did the likes of, spike tails, and, long necks, exist in the Cretaceous period? We don't have samples of their fossils from that era, only the Jurassic, which was an incredibly long time before that. Ha, huh, ma'am, you are asking the wrong bot. Grimlock asserted. I'm a warrior, not a scientist. All I know is that I met and knew many different species of dinosaurs among my time in the Great Valley. A chuckle escaped his throat as he recalled a certain event. Hee hee, in fact, here's a funny little anecdote. When I managed to help the herd find the valley, they told me that there were a few stragglers that were lost in the earthquake. He raised four fingers. Four children, one of whom unfortunately lost his mother to a sharp tooth attack during the event. Oh no, Abara placed a hand over her chest, though she was also rather taken aback feeling empathy for a dinosaur of all things. That's horrible. It was, but the silver lining here is that, right when I was about to head out to try and find them, haha, ha, they were right at the entrance to the valley. Ha ha ha. Grimlock laughed joyously, placing a hand over his midsection. Ha ha. Oh, I gave them a good scare, that's for sure. But I assured them that they were in the right place. They'd even found a baby spike tail that they brought along with them. Many heralded that day as a miracle. May pointed up at him with a wink. And let me guess, you were seen as the head of that herd from that point on, right? Grimlock chuckled and gave a shrug. Hey, well, it wasn't a unanimous decision at first. There was a certain stubborn three-horn who wasn't too keen on the idea, but eventually, he came around to it. He raised his hand up to the ceiling. Fun fact, it was actually one of those same children who discovered this ship's resting place. Quite the stroke of luck. Wow, an Autobot being seen as leader of a dinosaur herd. Itsuka placed her hands on her hips. It almost sounds too good to be true. At her comment, though, Grimlock, the Autobots and 1A students all shared knowing looks, a few even snickering at it. W what? What's so funny? Kata grinned widely at the 1B students. Oh, it's just that it's not as implausible as you might think, especially given what Grimlock transforms into. She lifted her head up to the gladiator and gave him a thumbs up. Show him, Grim. Ha ha. Gladly. On that note, Grimlock lurched forward and slammed his fists against the floor, his body contorting into a much different form. And, to the astonishment of May and the 1B students, it wasn't a vehicle of any sort. Instead, it was a Tyrannosaurus Rex, one who roared and spewed flames from his maw as he lifted his massive head high. Gurah. Needless to say, the five of them were completely slack-jawed, as was Flare Up. I I I'm sorry, what? The scout exclaimed. Windblade glanced over to the group. Yeah, remember how Grimm said that Shockwave experimented on him and his team? She jerked a thumb over to the towering giant. This is the result. G-R-A-A-G-H. Yes. Me Grimlock am sharp tooth. Even though they could see that right in front of them, Itsuka, Abara, Tetsu and Mei were still in complete and utter disbelief. Setsuna, on the other hand, was having a complete field day. Ah. Oh my freaking god. She fell to her knees and thrust her hands up, heralding the king's arrival. Grimlock, he's, he's a. A dinosaur. Itsuka exclaimed. A robot dinosaur. Abara uttered. Ajiro and Mina couldn't help but scrunch their faces at the awkward wording. 
E.H., there's gotta be a better way to say that, the redhead mused. Mina scratched her chin in thought. Yeah, you read my mind. He's a dinosaur but also an Autobot. After a few seconds, the duo's eyes lit up as an idea entered their minds, and simultaneously, they shouted, he's a Dinobot. The other Autobots were taken aback by the sudden designation, but the more they thought about it, the more it made sense. A, hey, Dinobot, huh? Windblade mused. I actually kinda like it. She set her optics upon Grimlock to get his opinion. And if all of your team is like this now, then maybe you can all be Dinobots. Lightning Strike Coalition Force was a bit of a mouthful. Dino, bots, Grimlock repeated before giving an approving stomp. Ha, huh. me Grimlock like. Now me Grimlock will be known as a Dinobot from here on. That is so freaking cool. Kata cheered. I very much approve of this name change. Setsuna went up to her and shared a high five. I second that, sister. And the fact that Grimlock is a goddamn Tyrannosaurus Rex makes it all the more awesome. Uh, Ty, Ty ran oh, huh. Grimlock tilted his head. What you talking about? Kato cleared his throat to get the big guy's attention. Ahem, it's the scientific name that we've given to, sharp teeth, as you call them, Grimlock. We also tend to call them, T-Rexes, for short. Krista added. T, Rex, hem, much easier to say. On that note, Grimlock reassumed his robot mode and shook his head, coming back to his senses. Ha, huh, in any case, I definitely wasn't too thrilled with the new alternate mode that Shockwave forced upon me. However, I quickly found that the dinosaurs respected my authority while I was in that form. The Dinobot's voice took a much gentler tone as he reminisced about those old days. They were thankful that I was their ally from that day forward, because then they knew for sure that they were well protected from any other sharp tooth that may come their way. And, in time, I went from just the leader of the herd, to their king. Ochako pointed up to the crown. And I'm guessing you made that to celebrate the occasion. Picking up the head ornament, Grimlock shook his head. Well, not exactly. This was once a simple homing device that was made for this ship. But, the little ones got the idea into their head to fashion it into a crown for me to wear. He placed it upon his head once again. I liked the idea so much that I said, why not? Ha ha. On that note, Optimus stepped forward, his optics focused directly on his friend. Well, I am certainly quite grateful that you found your way, Grimlock. He brought his sights down, though, as he recalled their last interaction. Admittedly, I felt an immense guilt when you contacted Yakin from Shockwave's lab when you made your escape. And your words have stuck with me ever since. Right. Grimlock nodded, recalling what he said as well. I, accused you of abandoning us. Of not doing enough to stop the Decepticons. Running away when you should have fought to the bitter end. He sighed heavily and sat down in his chair. In that moment, my emotions were doing most of the talking for me. All I felt then was an incredible rage, and pain. Pain, Kata muttered. Yes, Kata. I was, awake while Shockwave experimented on me. That earned a round of gasps from the Autobots and even the humans as Grimlock's grip tightened against his chair. He didn't do the same with my other teammates. He did it to me specifically because he thought he'd be able to break my spirit. He scoffed and his visor briefly changed to red again. HMPH, but he was wrong. Very wrong. Standing back up, Grimlock continued, I also felt an intense, insatiable anger. Against Shockwave, against myself, and I projected that all onto everyone around me, even those who didn't deserve it. He met Prime's gaze once again, his visor going back to blue. Really, I should be the one apologizing to you, Optimus. There is no need, Grimlock. Optimus shook his head. After what you and your team went through, I cannot blame you for the way you felt toward us. We should have made a more concerted effort to find you. Grimlock raised his hand. But you had many things to deal with back then. The Ark's launch, Alita insisting that she take the mission, it was a tense time for everyone. The Dinobot approached Prime and extended his hand. Now, though, I think now's a good time to make a fresh start to things, wouldn't you say? Let us unite in finding the Ark and turning the tide of this war back against the Khans. How does that sound, hem? Beneath his faceplate, Prime smiled and shook Grimlock's hand without hesitation. Haha, ha, I say that sounds like a fantastic idea, old friend. Let's do it. A round of cheers erupted throughout the room from human and Autobot alike, though toward the back, 
Grimlock could still see Springer reserving himself, keeping his arms folded across his chest. Woohoo! Welcome to the team, Grimlock. Sideswipe cheered. Glad to have ya back on board. Sunstreaker gave a thumbs up. Haha, ha, thank you, thank you, everyone. Grimlock pushed his hands out, signaling them to calm down. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's still much work to be done if we're to track down the Ark. Red Alert, however, was keen on contending with that. Oh, I wouldn't say so. After all, we do have this ship. He went over to a control console and began inputting commands. It may not be flight capable, but at the very least, we should be able to activate the Ark's homing BAC. CCHHHZZZAP asterisk. Ah. Just then, a random circuit had suddenly shorted out near Red Alert's foot, causing him to jerk backward and fall on his rear. Grimlock groaned and picked the medic up by his backpack, bringing him back to his feet. You think I didn't already try that, Red? Nearly everything on this freight was fried upon re-entry. It was a miracle that we managed to get anything working on this thing. He thrust a hand over toward a different control console. The only system we could get working was the orbital scanners, and even then, all it ever detected was that stupid space rock. Well, that's swell. Springer threw his hands up. That means we're right back to square one when it comes to finding that freight. Not necessarily, the Dinobot leader said, raising a finger to him. Because while I was never able to pinpoint the Ark's location in the distant past, I did sometimes go on journeys outside the Great Valley whenever it was necessary for the herd to move. Whether it be due to seasonal shifts, locust swarms, you get the picture. And along the way, Grimlock moved toward a storage unit and opened it up, revealing heaps of scrap metal that were no doubt from the ship. I would collect these little miracles. RC went in and took up one of the scraps, doing a quick analysis of it. Ha, huh, yep, yeah, that's part of the Ark. So, you're saying that there could be more pieces out there? Correct. Grimlock gave a nod, and if we can find a high enough concentration of these pieces, we'll surely be on the right track. He shrugged his massive shoulders. It'll be a tedious process, but if we can pull it off, there may be hope yet. RC concluded handing the fragment to Red Alert. Red, do you think that these fragments could have a signature that can be traced? The medic grimaced and shook his head. Unfortunately, it doesn't exactly work that way. However, I can try to cross-reference these fragments on the internet and see if there's any place on Earth that's found them in the modern day. His attention shifted to Fowler, presenting the fragment to him. And Agent Fowler, perhaps your people may know something about these fragments. Fowler's nose scrunched unsurely. E.H., I've never seen anything like that before in my life, if I'm being honest. He placed a hand to his hip while his other hand scratched his chin. I'll ask the other branches of Sector 7 about it, though, see if we can't come up with anything. Thank you, Agent Fowler. Optimus bowed his head gratefully. We would appreciate the effort. The Prime set his attention back to his Autobots who, along with the humans, were all looking back at him expectingly. Today marks a significant step in our search for the Ark. We may not have the means of detecting it, but we do have a lead. Let us hope that these fragments prove fruitful in finding it, and possibly those stray stasis pods as well. He then lifted his arm, placing it upon Grimlock's shoulder. More importantly, though, we have brought an old friend back from the brink, and to that, I'd say that's just as significant a victory as finding the Ark itself. ZRKT, truer words were never spoken, old chap. Bumblebee said before hastily tapping his wrist. ZRKT, now come on, let's get a move on. ZRKT, time is running out. At B's declaration, Izuku, Kyoka and Momo's eyes all widened and they took out their phones, realizing that they only had 15 minutes to get back home. AAAAHH. Crap, crap, crap. Izuku panicked. We stuck around too long. Someone opened the ground bridge, now. Kyoka insisted. Otherwise we're in deep trouble and they might ground us even longer. Already on it. Windblade assured, bringing her hand up to her cum link. Signal flare, this is Windblade. Time to bridge us home. In just a few seconds, the ground bridge opened in the middle of the room and the three grounded teens all made a mad dash for it, not waiting for anyone else. Windblade glanced back to Jazz and B with an amused grin. Hey, well boys, I'd say that's our cue. No doubt. Jazz agreed, him and B following the city speaker. 
Before he stepped through the portal, though, he ushered over to Grimlock. Come on, Grim, I think you're gonna like our pad back over in Japan. Beachfront property, baby. As the other Autobots began following as well, Grimlock let out a laugh. Ha ha, I can't wait to see it, but before he left, the Dinobot took one last glance around the place he knew his home for so long, a sad sigh escaping him. However, he felt a familiar touch on his foot, leading him to see Kata and her parents there next to him. You okay, Grimlock? Do you need some time, dear? Krista asked as well. Grim shook his head and knelt down to them. Haha, ha, no, no, just, taking one last look at the place. He took his crown and set it upon his empty seat, his thoughts going out to all of his friends who perished in the cataclysmic impact. Thank you all, for everything. You can always come back, Grimlock. Red Alert said, having seen his friend make the small memorial. I'll save the coordinates of this place, just in case you want to reminisce. Ha, huh, thanks, Red. I'd appreciate that. Standing up to his full height, Grimlock pumped a fist. Now, let's go. I'm eager to get going on this new start of mine. Kata beamed up to him when she heard that. Great. Because, um, hee hee, she eyed her parents sheepishly. There, uh, there may be a couple of other people that we need to bring some peace of mind to back home. Kato and Krista were confused as first, but it didn't take long for them to put two and two together. Oh, oh, you mean them, the father uttered. Hem, what? Grimlock tilted his head. Who's, them? You'll find out soon, big guy. Kata said with a sigh, gesturing for him to follow. Come on, I'll explain along the way. Comma dot dot. The next day, Kentaro Kiryu was incredibly worried at the moment. Right when his sister got home from school, she told him and Kiki to get themselves together and come with her, somewhere. She was with Shoto and another friend of hers, Mina, along with a tall African-American man that he swore recognized from the sports festival. The man introduced himself as Buck Hudson, a government agent, and explained that this was a pretty important matter, concerning his family. Immediately, he and Kiki both realized what was going on, and one look from Kata only confirmed it. Without wasting another second, they climbed into Buck's Hummer, which coincidentally was the same model as his dad's, and they were all off. But even still, there were some lingering questions on the young hero's mind. Ishido, why exactly are you here? He spoke up from the backseat, peering at Mina in the passenger's side up front before moving his gaze to his sister's best friend. And you too, Shoto. How did you two get involved in this? Ah, well, that's kinda complicated, actually, Mina rubbed her neck, only for Buck to step in. Please save all questions for when we get to the meetup spot. The man caught Kentaro's eye in his rearview mirror. Trust me, kid, you're gonna have a lot more by the time we get there, so it's best if you save him. Kiki was practically huddled in Kata's lap, her eyes darting around while having no clue what was happening. This is scary, I I wanna go back home. But Kata began caressing her little sister's hair soothingly, trying to calm her down. SSH, it's okay, Kiki. I promise you, it's nothing that serious. Not serious. Kentaro repeated in disbelief. Kata, you were approached by government agent about what mom and dad found. This isn't something to be taken lightly. Shoto reached over and placed a hand on Kentaro's shoulder. Ken, believe me it's like she's saying. This whole thing isn't as bad as it appears. Once we get to the meetup point, we'll... Aha, uh -huh. we're here, Mina announced, bringing everybody's attention forward. There, out of the windshield, they saw that they were brought to a rather expansive field, covered in nothing but grass and the odd boulder that was sticking out of the ground. And hey, there they are waiting for us, Mina pointed out. Kentaro's eyes widened when he saw what she was talking about. There, standing in the middle of the field, were his parents. And they were standing next to a big red and blue semi-truck. What? Ha! Huh. Mama! Papa! The very moment the Hummer pulled to a halt, Kiki hopped straight out and made a mad sprint toward her parents, with her siblings not far behind. Mama! Papa! Krista's eyes lit up and she ran to meet her youngest daughter, laughing with delight as she scooped her up into her arms and spun around. A-H! Ha ha ha! My baby girl! Oh, it's so good to see you! She came to a standstill and poked the little girl in the tummy. Have you been eating well? Your brother's been keeping you fed, right? He he he, uh-huh. 
Ken's been taking care of both of us. Well, that's good to hear, honey. Kato said as he came forward and reached out to Ken, pulling him into a hug. Thank you for keeping things steady at the house, son. Sorry if we worried you or anything the last couple days. D dad, what are you talking about? Ken pulled away, raising a confused brow. W why are you two acting like everything's fine? A and why are you even here? He pointed over to the big truck as well. And what the heck is that thing doing here? The Kiryu parents shared a knowing smirk with Keita, only for Kato to wave it off. Ah, everything will become a lot clearer soon. Right now, though, we have a new friend to introduce the both of you to. Kiki gasped, bringing her hands to her mouth. Ah, a new friend. That's right, honey. Krista booped the little girl on the nose before setting her down. A really special new friend. You've actually already seen him before, but now, you actually get to meet him. Though, you may want to brace yourselves. Okay, seriously, mom, dad, what is going on? Kentaro thrust his hands toward Buck, Shoto and Mina. First we get a government agent telling us there's something important going on, then you two show up out of the blue, and now you're saying you wanna introduce us to someone. What about the giant robot? A are you two in trouble? Kato grasped his son by the shoulder, raising a calming hand. Son, deep breaths, slow down. I know that things seem confusing right now, but if you take a look over by those trees, things will become a lot clearer to you. Following the direction his father was pointing, Kentaro set his sights upon the thicket of nearby trees, and his eyes widened when he caught sight of something shining from deep in the dark underbrush. It was something bright and blue, and it was very high up. Just then, the blue light began to move forward, accompanied by what sounded like heavy footfalls and the sound of foliage breaking. Then, a pair of massive, metal arms parted the tree line, revealing the very same giant robot that they'd seen in the pictures just a couple days before. Slowly and carefully, it moved its way out into the open, where Kentaro and Kiki were left slack-jawed while Keita and their parents grinned at his arrival. I, 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 what? Kentaro exclaimed. Ah. Kiki screamed, hiding behind her mother's leg. It walks. The scary robot walks. Her terror-filled shriek immediately made the gray and gold robot stop in his tracks, to which Krista knelt down and pulled her little girl into her embrace once again. HM HM, darling, there's no need to be afraid. Yes, he walks, but he's also very friendly. She could see the bewilderment in her child's eyes, leading Krista to raise an arm up to the approaching bot. Kiki, Kenny, allow us to introduce you to our new friend, Grimlock. Grimlock stopped directly in front of the humans and knelt down, speaking as softly as he could as to not frighten the little one anymore. Greetings, young humans. Fret not, for I come in peace. He gave a nod to both of them. You must be Kentaro, and I take it you're Kiki, then. Hee hee, Keita and your parents have told me a lot about you too. It's very nice to meet you. Why why you tea talk? Kentaro exclaimed. Oh, I can do much more than just talk. But for now, I must apologize to you two for making you worry so much about your family. Grimlock placed a hand on his chest and bowed his head. I'm sorry for any stress I may have caused you. Running a hand through his hair, Kentaro took a deep breath. Who, well, uh, can't say that you're not still causing me a bit of stress, but, I guess you seem friendly enough. Gah. Without warning, Kiki knocked her brother in the shin, pouting up at him. Big brother, that's just rude. Be nice to the visitor. She jogged her way over and smiled up at Grimlock. Sorry, my big brother can be a bit of a worry ward. She balled her tiny hands into excited fists as her eyes shined up at the giant robot. So are you from space? Please tell me you're from space. Ha ha. Actually, I am. Grimlock laughed, extending a hand down to her. How'd you guess? Because I saw another giant robot fall from space and land in our pool a few months ago. Kiki exclaimed, which made a certain man behind them grimace in fear while Mina and Keita had to hold in their laughter. Even Shoto and the Kiryu parents had the slightest smirk on his face. Kiki, though, lowered her head with another pout. HMPH, but nobody believed me. Mama, Papa, Big Bro and Big Sis all say I dreamed it. Unlike the others, Grimlock was more than happy to let out a mighty guffaw. Ahahaha. Is that so, little one? Haha, well, Kiki, I think it's time we proved everybody that you're right. 
He nudged his head to his rotund, green friend. Isn't that right, Bulk? Rubbing his neck, Buck groaned and began to fade from existence, much to Kentaro and Kiki's shock. Yeah, I guess so. Prime, let's do it. On that note, WHRRTSCHZZTSCHZZTSCHZZZCHKT asterisk before their very eyes, Bulkhead and Optimus Prime assumed their robot modes, leaving the eldest and youngest Kiryu siblings both completely astonished. They stared wide-eyed and slack-jawed at the two, with Kiki's gaze directed straight at the big, green Autobot. Hey, heya, kid. Bulkhead waved. So, look familiar. Once Kiki got over her bewilderment, she pointed up at him frantically. It's you. You're the one who smashed our pool. At that point, no one could hold it back anymore. Aside from Shoto and Kentaro, the humans all let out a chorus of laughter, which Grimlock joined in with while Bulkhead's shoulders slumped. Ha ha ha. Don't worry, big guy. Kato asserted. He's right, Bulkhead, we're not upset. Krista echoed. Ha ha, more amused than anything, honestly. Ha, huh, well, I guess that's a relief. The wrecker sighed. Optimus, meanwhile, knelt before the family, his optics trained on Kentaro and Kiki. HMHM, HM, well, I suppose that is certainly one way of finding out our secret, he chortled. In any case, it's a pleasure to meet you too. Kata has told us much about you. My name is Optimus Prime. My friends here and I are Autobots from the planet Cybertron. So, you are aliens. Kentaro exclaimed. The Prime gave a nod. Indeed, but before I go any further, I have been asked by a friend to play some footage for you. Raising his arm, Optimus input a command that brought up a holographic screen. She has been working on a welcome speech for people who learn of our secret. I find it very informative, so please pay attention. The video began to play on the holoscreen, where at first, there was just a lonely chair in the center of an abandoned warehouse, the Autobot base. But then, from off screen, May appeared and took hold of the chair, spinning it around to sit on it backwards. She smiled, stared down the camera lens, and spoke, So, you've just learned about an alien race of giant robots. Not an everyday occurrence, right? Well, it happens more often to people than you might think. The teens all shared awkward grins with one another as May continued on, though the other Kiryu certainly seemed to be paying attention. Who boy, this could take a while. Kata rolled her eyes. So, to get you caught up on everything to know about the Cybertronian race, from out of her back pocket, May pulled out a roll of paper that reached down to the ground once it was unfurled. I've put together an extensive list of everything I've learned. A long while. Shoto muttered. Chapter 76. Sunday Funday. Comma dot dot. And so, in conclusion, the Autobots are here to help you feel safe in this massive world inhabited by heroes, villains, and now, Decepticons. If and when the rest of planet Earth finds out about the Transformers, we may not be ready for their war. Or their warriors. But all of our fates and the future of our worlds will be decided here. With a soft smile, May leaned in to stare down the camera reassuringly, all while rolling up her long, long list. So, in short, welcome to the Autobots. I think you're gonna like him. As May's video came to an end, Grimlock let out a mighty guffaw, he and Optimus strolling their way through Sector 7's headquarters. Ahahaha. Oh, by the Primes, how in the pit did she make that last over an entire decacycle? Prime couldn't help but chuckle himself, having watched the video in its entirety along with the entire Kiryu family just the day before. Haha, ha, an hour and a half long. I will admit, you can't say that it isn't informative. Hee <laughs> hee, very true. I could tell that she's been studying our kind very closely. Grimlock gave a sigh as the two came to a halt before the next door, craning his head down to his old friend. Prime. Yes, Grimlock. I know that I've already said this, but, I truly am sorry. For what I said back on Cybertron. Placing a hand to his hip, Grimlock reached his other hand up to his forehead. There's, a lot that I was going through at the time and. But Optimus raised his hand to the larger bot, stopping him from going any further. Grimlock, there is no need for apologies. We are both guilty of several mistakes during that time. He gave a frustrated sigh. I will say, there are times, when I wish I had taken more initiative against the Decepticons during the more crucial moments of the war. The Decepticons attack on the Ark, the incident on the Science Division space station, and of course, you and your team's disappearance. 
He met his friend's optics with an awkward gaze. You aren't the only one who wishes they had done things differently. The Dinobot let out a short scoff. Ha, huh, ain't that the truth? He gave his own sigh, shrugging his massive shoulders. Well, I suppose that's what this is all about, right? My fresh start on a new planet. New environment, same mission, beat the scrap out of Decepticon punks. And I know I can always count on you for that, old friend. Optimus knocked Grimlock on the arm, which he reciprocated before the door opened for them. Now come, it's time for you to meet the new recruits. With one turn around the corner, Prime immediately saw the multi-colored squadron of Omnic and Miners with signal flare directing their actions, all of them moving Energon cubes into large containment units. Good morning, Omnicans, he announced his presence, making everyone instantly come to a halt. Ah, Optimus Prime, signal flare saluted, his men mirroring the action. Good morning to you as well. To what do we owe the pleasure of this visit? Optimus raised his hand toward the corner he came around. I've brought a certain friend here to introduce to your crew. Given his history with the Viacons, I wanted them to meet in as controlled an environment as possible. Hearing this, Signal Flare immediately understood what the Prime was talking about. Ah, yes, that's right. It's his checkup day, isn't it? All right, I understand. He stepped around to face the other Omnicans, calling out, everyone, fall in. Once each of the multicolored squad was in a row, Signal Flare took a head count, and realized that a certain someone was missing. That means you, too, Steve. You, 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 gh. An aggravated groan heralded the arrival of the lone Viacon amongst the group, all as he sulked his way into view. I swear to Primus, I am so freaking over this. Signal Flare shook his head in disappointment. It hasn't even been a week, soldier. Kindly get over yourself. Hey, you're not the one stuck doing inventory everywhere in this place. As he'd passed by Optimus Prime, Steve leered up to the Autobot commander sourly. Forgive me if I have no qualms with speaking my mind, sir. Despite the venom behind his words, Optimus merely gave a shrug. Soldier, I myself have no qualms with you speaking your mind. I only ask that you do not disrespect your peers in doing so. He raised a hand toward the other Omnicans. After all, they are doing their level best to earn their dues. Steve could only scoff and cross his arms. Hey, what dues? We weren't getting paid even before jumping off the Decepticon boat. Hey, we're working for our freedom here, pal. Kyle rebutted flippantly with a dismissing wave. There can be plenty of time for us to earn a living once the war's over. He's right, Hank asserted, with Dan, Kevin, Charlie, Dave, Gary and Tyler all nodding in affirmation. We're all doing our part to make sure that the ones who are fighting this battle can come out alright. We're the ones mining the Energon, so the least we can do is make sure that everything is in its place for them. At the yellow and grey bot's statement, a loud and proud guffaw was heard around the corner. Ah ha ha, excellent. All at once, every Omnic and present were suddenly left cold and paralyzed at the sight of Grimlock approaching from the side, the Autobot's titanic frame eclipsing them all easily. Now that is what I like to hear from new recruits. Go-getters like you need to be praised for your dedication. All he received was a stunned silence as the faceless cons all stared back at him, leaving Grimlock confused. Ah, uh, was it something I said? That at least managed to jostle Kevin out of his stunned state, the green and black Omnican rubbing his neck nervously. Oh oh, um, and no sir. Nothing at all. Actually, Signal Flare had already told us ahead of time that the Autobots had found you, but, W we just didn't expect you to drop by so soon. Oh yeah, sure, it can't be the fact that he's freaking Grimlock. Steve cried out in astonishment and fear to his comrades. Ya yeah, no, the same Autobot who's slaughtered billions of Viacons in over the course of this slag and war. He and his team have practically left our kind butchered. Tapping his chin, Grimlock suddenly felt very awkward. Ah, yes, right. W well, if it helps, I've never once slain a Viacon miner. Dunno if that makes it any better, ya big pile of. Steve, signal flare berated before setting his attention to the Dinobot. My apologies, Grimlock. He's, um, not exactly acclimating to the Autobot way of life as easily as the others. Grimlock, though, was nonplussed about it. Ah, no need to apologize. Trust me, I've seen plenty of his kind before. He craned his head back down to the lone Viacon, 
placing his hand firmly on his shoulder before he could even think to move. Listen here, uh, Steve, was it. Unfortunately, the purple bot deadpanned. I know that things may not be to your liking right now. Grimlock continued, blowing past the unsavory comment. But trust me when I say that you'll feel right at home with the Autobots in no time. He placed his hand over his chest. Speaking from personal experience, I was once seen as the scariest bot on Cybertron for a long time due to my infamy in the gladiatorial arenas, so much that no ordinary bot would even speak to me. But then, I came across four bots who were just as rough and tumble as I was, and you know what happened next. Steve scoffed and replied, yeah, who doesn't? The battle of Polyhex where the five of you turned the tide against the Decepticons because they interrupted your dinner. The memory made Grimlock laugh heartedly. Ha ha ha. Ah, what a destroyed table full of beryllium bologna and cesium salami sandwiches will do a bunch of bots. He continued his story from there. Ha, huh. anyways, after that day, we were seen as heroes amongst the citizens, and the Autobots wasted no time in asking for our services. His sights shifted back to Prime. I believe it was Ultra Magnus who was there that day, correct? Hmm, indeed. Optimus recalled. And at first, he was vehemently outspoken against bringing you in, saying you and your crew were far too violent. Pointing at the Autobot leader, Grimlock countered. But you said that violence was just the thing you needed, didn't you? More or less. Optimus shrugged. I was more an admirer of your team's efficiency in battle. The violence was a bonus. Glaring at the Prime, Steve grumbled. So, you're the reason why Viacons are afraid to take stasis naps, oof. But Grimlock gave him a reassuring pat on the shoulder. Well, you don't have to worry about that anymore, Steve. Not while you're on the Autobots' side. He turned back to the rest of the Omnicans with a raised fist. And that goes for the rest of you, too. It's an honor to welcome to the Autobot ranks. All of the Omnicans expressed their gratitude through a shared bow. Th thank you, Grimlock, sir. Dan exclaimed. Though, um, if you don't mind me asking, Charlie raised a finger. What brings you here, anyway? I doubt you'd come all just way just to meet us. Ah, I wouldn't say that. Grimlock dismissed. I'd have come even if I didn't have a better reason, I assure you. However, a new voice entered the conversation at that moment. But really, he does. Everyone's attention was brought toward the opposite end of the room, where Red Alert was waiting, staring expectantly at the Dinobot. Because I asked him to come specifically for a checkup. And if he's smart, he'll follow his doctor's orders. Sheepishly, Grimlock rubbed his neck with a slight chuckle. He he he, ah, guess I've been caught. He nodded down to the Omnicans. Indeed, I've been asked by Red to let him give me a once-over to see just how much damage Shockwave did to me during his experiments. He wants to see if any of this can be reversed, though I highly doubt it. Grimlock, if there's even a chance that I can get one thing back to normal in you, then I'll give it my damnedest. The medic asserted, pointing into the next room over. Now come on in. I've got the whole setup ready for you. Ha, huh, I still don't see why we couldn't do this back at base, Red. Grimlock shrugged, proceeding forward nonetheless. All of a sudden, a very shrill voice piped up, bringing his attention toward the floor. Cause we don't have the proper equipment to do this kinda analysis back at base. There, standing near his feet, was none other than Mei Hatsume, with one hand firmly on her hip as she jerked her thumb over her shoulder. Now march, big guy. It's time to get things going. HMHM, you heard her, Grimlock. Optimus chortled, amused by his friend's stunned silence. Mei takes Autobot healthcare quite serious. Shaking his head, Grimlock laughed a little as well. Haha, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. With one last wave to the Omnicans, Grimlock proceeded into the examination room. Well, wish me luck. As the door closed and everyone got back to work, though, Steve couldn't help but ponder on what the Dinobot had told him. Feeling right at home, huh? HMPH, I'll believe it when I see it. Comma dot dot. Back in Musutufu, Kyoko was gearing up for her most highly anticipated, and simultaneously most dreaded day of the week. Sunday had come along, and not only did that mean that there was but one more day of their grounding to go, but it also meant that it was time to go visit the hero exhibit. Meaning that she'd be spending the entire day with not only Izuku, but also her dad. God, just kill me now. 
She thought to herself as she buried her face in her knees in the back of the family car, which also just so happened to be Jazz. Kyotoku and Nika were seated up front as they drove to the Midoriya's apartment complex. Thanks for letting me drive ya today, Jazz. Kyotoku said with a pat on the Autobot's steering wheel. I always wanted to drive a classic car like the one you are. Ah, glad I could make your dream a reality, Toku. Jazz obliged, calling the man by the nickname he came up for him. Sides, it's always interesting, getting someone else behind the wheel every now and then. Mika tilted her head at that. Hem, but the children are far too young to drive you, but then, she narrowed her eyes suspiciously at her daughter in the rearview mirror. That is, unless they've been breaking even more rules that we don't know about. Whipping her head up, Kyoka vehemently denied the accusation. W what? Mom, no way. I'm not stupid enough to get caught behind the wheel of a car without a license. She grimaced and glanced off to the side. Can't exactly say the same for my other friends if they end up in a situation like that, but I digress. A slight smirk appeared on Kyotoku's face, briefly eyeing Kyoka as well. Oh really? Tell me, sweetie, if that hypothetical situation were to happen, who do you think would get caught? He sent her a teasing grin. Your friend, Midoriya, maybe. PSH, you wish, old man. Kyoka waved off flippantly. Izuku's, like, the third smartest student in class. He's a bit brash, sure, but he's not dumb. She leaned back in her seat and pondered on the question. Honestly, you're more likely to find Kaminari or Mina doing crap like that, maybe Kirishima or Tetsu Tetsu, too if they were careless enough. Ah, so Mr. Zap, Miss Pink, the faux hawk kid and his metal friend. The punk rocker's expression soured at the nicknames. Is that seriously what you know them as? Hey, I've only seen him on TV, okay. Mika cleared her throat and pointed ahead. Ahem, not that this conversation isn't interesting, but we're coming up on the apartment. Sure enough, they were closing in on the complex, where Bumblebee was already waiting outside for them. She peered down to the dashboard and asked, Jazz, if you would. 10-4, ma'am. Jazz affirmed. I'll pop on the old horn and get their attention. Comma dot dot. Meanwhile, inside the apartment itself, Izuku was in a similar excited, nervous mood as Kyoka. If it had just been the two of them, he wouldn't have been so meticulous with his appearance, but since her dad would be with them, too, he decided to appear his best for the occasion. He had on a green polo shirt, a pair of black shorts, and of course, his signature red sneakers. Dress for success as mom puts it, he thought to himself in an attempt to get himself pumped. Unfortunately for him, he was met with another clothing-related problem when he came out of his room. Which looks better, Izuku. His mother had asked, Inko presenting him with a pair of skirt suits, one navy blue, one pale pink. As Inko shifted the sweets back and forth over her body, Izuku sheepishly grinned as a drop of sweat dripped off his forehead. M mom, don't you think that these are a bit much for just a shopping trip? Oh oh, no, no, this isn't for that. Inko pulled the suits away, revealing her blue blouse, white undershirt and tan skirt with matching shoes. I've already decided on what I'll be wearing today. What I'm trying to decide now is what to wear tomorrow for your parents' day. Her expression turned serious as she leaned toward her son. So, which one? Izuku backed away with a nervous laugh, still a tad overwhelmed. Fashion advice wasn't his forte, but he knew better than to just not give an answer to his mother. Um, that one. He pointed to the one in her left hand. The navy. Isn't it a little dark? W well, what about the other one, then? Hmm, Inko scrutinized the pale pink suit indecisively. But don't you think people might think I'm not dressing my age? Are you sure? She brought the suit back over her body, and it only made her more uncertain. Oh, and I think it makes me seem fatter than I am. With an exasperated sigh, Izuku tried to reassure his mother. Mom, one, stop body shaming yourself. That's unhealthy. And two, I'm sure it'll be fine. Besides, we're gonna have two. Honk honk honk. The son and mother duo were brought out of their debate thanks to a car horn, which Izuku was more than thankful for. Ha, ah, saved by the jazz. He brightened up and made straight for the door. Oh, there they are now. Come on, don't wanna keep them waiting, right? Inko, though, was still in crisis mode. W wait. She hustled over to the nearby body-length mirror, 
once again holding up each skirt suit in front of her to her son's chagrin. Um, okay, I think I've decided on the navy. She laid the pink suit on the couch while admiring the deep blue one. It'll hide the stains better at any rate. Ah, what stains? There were few scenarios that Izuku could think of where his mother would encounter stains at UA, so he was understandably confused. Well, I mean, we're going to tour the facilities and the campus, right? Inko reminded. Like that USJ disaster dome. I'd better be prepared to pick up a little grime in hectic places like that. On that note, she grabbed her purse, smiling as if what she said wasn't weird at all. Anyhow, shall we go? Oh, ah, uh, sure. Izuku opened the door, allowing his mother out first while trying to wrap his head around what she'd just told him. I think I'm starting to see where I get my paranoia from. All the same, the mother and son duo traversed down the steps to ground level, where Bumblebee and Jazz were parked at the curb. And there, standing there with greeting smiles, were the Jiros. Morning, Inko. Mika greeted brightly. And hello, Izuku. Good morning, Mrs. Jiro. Izuku bowed politely. Inko clapped her hands together, elated to see Mika dressed so well in her lavender button-up and black skirt with matching heels. Ah, Mika, that look is so cute on you. The Jiro matriarch touched her cheek bashfully. Oh, you think so? Well, you look just as nice, Inko. That blue is so flattering. Oh, stop. And just like that, the two women were caught up giggling, leaving Izuku, Kyoka and Kyotoku in an awkward place. God, if I ever act like that at their age, please kill me, the punk rocker pleaded. Izuku chuckled sheepishly, rubbing his neck. Ah ha ha, I I wouldn't go that far, but I probably would help you snap back to your senses. Ah, thanks, green bean. Kyoka's smile widened. Glad you've always got my back. Before either of them could pick up on a conversation, Kyotoku got between the two and interjected himself in. Ahem, while I couldn't agree more with that, I have to say, he lifted his head, giving Izuku an intimidating gaze. At first, Izuku was scared stiff, but then, to his surprise, he was actually given a compliment. You clean up well, boy. I'm impressed. Aha, uh -huh, th thanks, Mr. Jiro. But then, Izuku noticed that he was, probably a bit overdressed compared to Kyoka. She was in her signature yellow deep dope tank top with the red lettering on the front, a pair of black shorts, matching sneakers and of course, her spiked bracelet that he often saw on her outside of school. She was very casual while he was neat and proper. The duality of friends, I guess. Unfortunately, though, Kyoka caught him looking. Something wrong, dude. Falling out of his stupor, Izuku shook his head fervently. And no, nothing at all. It's just, well, I think I might have dressed a bit too upmarket for the occasion. Kyotoku apparently knew exactly what he was talking about. If you mean how my lovely daughter is dressed, trust me, I get it. He narrowed his eyes at Kyoka, who was more than happy to grimace back. I tried to convince her to wear something a bit more extravagant for the event, but if you hadn't noticed, she's very stubborn. And if you hadn't noticed, old man, you're just as stubborn as me, if not more. Kyoka huffed, snicking her nose up defiantly. I'll wear what I want, thanks. Besides, it's not like Izuku cares or anything, right? Oh of course not. Izuku waved panickily. Your clothes are awesome the way they are. Kyoka grinned triumphantly while her father groaned, already feeling tired from all this. Thankfully, the lady saw the little spat and sought to control it. Now, now, let's not fly off the handle before you three even get anywhere. Mika stepped in, reaching up to put her hands on her husband and daughter's shoulders firmly with a harrowingly intimidating smile. I thought we agreed that this wouldn't be an argument starting day, correct? All right, honey. Kyotoku stiffened up immediately. Yes, ma'am. Kyoka agreed swiftly. Inko clapped her hands together happily. Good. Now, you three should probably get going. The exhibit opens soon, doesn't it? Izuku nodded curtly and went to climb into Jazz's backseat. Right, we've gotta get going. You heard Izuku. Mika said as she practically shoved her Kyotoku and Jiro in on the other side. Time to roll out. And Jazz, I expect you to keep a close eye on things on this little outing. If they get into any sort of spat, you tell me, understand. Even the lieutenant had to admit, he was fairly unsettled by Mika's deathly serious tone. 
She could probably give Ultra Magnus a run for his money. Even still, he made sure to comply with her wishes. No problem, Mrs. J. I'll watch him like a hawk. At that, Mika's smile became much less threatening, but even then, her husband and daughter could still hear the scary undertone in her voice. Excellent. You all have fun now, and remember, keep things civil, please. On that note, Jazz pulled away from the curb, carrying Izuku and the two internally screaming Jiros away from the apartments. As they went out of sight, Mika slumped her shoulders with a tired sigh. Ha, huh, those two, I swear. It's like I'm taking care of two children. Hmm, after seeing that, I understand. Inko affirmed as a nervous bead of sweat trickled down her cheek. However, her bright mood returned as she reminded her friend of their own outing. But don't worry, today's all about shopping the stress away. Once Mitsuki gets here, I'm sure we'll all have tons of fun out on the town. Mika's lips curled back up and she raised a determined fist. Right, sounds like a plan, though I will admit, I'm a bit nervous, too. She reached up and absentmindedly started twisting one of her earphone jacks. I mean, you said that this was young Bakugo's mother, right? The violent boy with the explosion quirk. Inko coughed at the mention of Katsuki, knowing exactly what Mika might have been implying. Ahem, why yes, the very same. But I assure you, Mitsuki is, well, she's kind of like her son, but far from the same temperament that he has. Her expression became sad as certain memories came cropping back up. It's so surreal to think about, honestly. Back when Izuku and Katsuki were small, they were once the best of friends. But when Katsuki got his quirk and Izuku didn't, there was a visible rift between them, and they stopped interacting entirely when they became teenagers. Inko rubbed her arms, almost as if trying to comfort herself. And since then, Mitsuki and I have seen each other much less over the years. Pursing her lips, Mika could see exactly what her new friend was worried about. I see, you're concerned that things won't be the same between the two of you. Is that it? She received a single nod. Hmm, well, since she still accepted the invitation, I'm sure it won't be as bad as you think it is, right? Maybe, but when I invited her, our conversation was very short and a bit awkward. Inko tapped her fingers together. I just hope that. Sorry I'm late. The arrival of a new voice brought the two out of their conversation, their sights moving down the street to see a young woman rushing toward them from down the street. At least, to Mika, she was a young woman. In reality, she was the same age as both of her and Inko, even though she appeared to be in her 20s. She wore a purple cardigan and white undershirt with a black skirt and purple sandals, though her wild blonde hair and beady red eyes were what gave her away as Katsuki Bakugo's mother. Ah, M. Mitsuki. Inko gave a nervous grin. There you are. Approaching the two with labored breaths, Mitsuki scratched her head irritably, her beautiful features twisted in aggravation. Yeah, again, sorry for being late. Been so long since I came this way that I took a wrong freaking turn. Inko waved her hand in reassurance. Oh, no, that's quite understandable. To be honest, I'm just happy you decided to come as well since, oh our phone call the night before wasn't. Oh, yeah, that, Mitsuki clenched her teeth, her hand still on her neck as she apologized. Sorry if that was so awkward. I was really excited that you called, though. Especially since things at the house have been, a bit hectic. Katsuki. Katsuki. The blonde woman affirmed, with both hands now furiously ruffling through her hair. Gah. I seriously dunno what I'm gonna do with that boy. He drives me and his father crazy. Worst part is that Masaru just lets the boy walk all over him. I love the man to death, but he's never had a freaking spine when it comes to Katsuki's crap. As the two women continued their conversation, Mika remained silent, and completely astounded by what she saw before her. This, bombastic, hourglass-shaped bombshell of a woman, was Katsuki Bakugo's mother. She seems like one of those Gyaru girls I saw back in high school. The music maker thought, adjusting her glasses in her shock. So loud and brash, while Inko's so soft-spoken. They're like complete opposites and yet they're talking like the best of friends. How in the world? But then, she was caught staring. Hey, you okay, girl? Mitsuki asked with a brazen gaze. Hick. Mika hiccuped in fear, trembling at the idea she might have angered the woman. Oh, um, I I'm okay, I, uh. Inko lightly hit the palm of her hand with a closed fist. Oh, that's right, 
I haven't introduced you to. Her soft smile managed to calm Mika down a bit as she stepped between them. Mitsuki, I want you to meet my new friend, Mika Jiro. She lives across town and her daughter is one of Izuku's best friends. She then faced the more apprehensive woman. And Mika, this is Mistuki Bakugo. She and I have been friends since high school. High school, friends, Mika repeated. Yep, every high school conventional stereotype is being shattered before my very eyes. With a proud grin, Mitsuki placed a fist over her chest. Hmm, yep, that's right. I'm pretty much the one who kept Inko safe from all the mean girls. She then gave a polite bow to the smaller woman. It's nice to meet ya, and if I had to guess, your girl is the one with those cool ears like yours. The one who made it to the sports festival finals, right? Ah, yes, that's my Kyoka. At that moment, Mitsuki put on a sly smirk. Yeah, I remember, she's also the one who pretty much partnered up with Izuku through the first two rounds, EH. She closed her eyes and nodded in approval. HMHM, that's great. Bout time little Zuzu got a girlfriend. Both Inko and Mika flinched at the presumption, the former shaking her head. Oh, no, no, Mitsuki, you misunderstand. Izuku and Kyoka aren't in a relationship. Y-E-T. Mitsuki winked. Right. Yet. Mika admitted with a shrug. There are some signs that they like each other more than they're letting on, be but we haven't pressured them into doing anything. With another hum, Mitsuki seemed to calm down a bit. Hum, I see. Well, either way, you two should be ecstatic. In an instant, her irritated grimace came back tenfold. Hell knows I've been on Katsuki's ass about getting a girlfriend. But no, it's always, Deku, this and, scale belly, that. Gah. The kid's got no siblings, so it's up to him to continue the bloodline, damn it. The other two women broke out into a nervous sweat at her tirade. A aren't you jumping the just a little, Mitsuki? Inko questioned. He is still only in high school, after all. Maybe, but I'm trying to ensure my family's future here, Inko. Mitsuki clenched a fist. And maybe a woman's resolve is just what that boy needs to chill the hell out. Ultimately, though, she shook her head and moved to a different topic. Anyway, where is my nephew? I was hopping, to talk to him a little. Oh, sorry, Mitsuki, but you just missed him. He and Kyoka went with her father to a hero exhibition across town. Go, no, damn, guess I'll just have to catch him some other time. Jerking her thumb over her shoulder, Mitsuki exclaimed, Well, come on, let's get to the train station and get this shopping spree started. Before the blonde could walk away, though, Inko brought her to a halt. W wait, there won't be any need for that. She walked over to the yellow Volkswagen at the curb and pat the rooftop. Because today, we've got a chauffeur. Hearing that, Brian peeked his head out the window, smiling at the Bakugo matriarch with a silent wave. Mitsuki, this is Brian. He's another of Izuku's friends and has volunteered to take us around town. Seeing the blonde young man, Mitsuki was certainly surprised, in a pleasant way. Oh, another one of Zuzu's friends, E.H. She sauntered over and leaned against the driver's side door, practically looming over Brian with an interested gaze. Well, I'm certainly glad my nephews made so many friends, especially if they're as handsome as yourself. In the back of Bumblebee's mind, he knew that this was all harmless flirting. She was a married woman after all. But then the little voice at the forefront of his thoughts was screaming at him, Midnight 2.0. Midnight 2.0. It only got worse when she lowered his face so that it was directly in front of his. Well, if you're to be our ride today, young man, I'll make sure to give you a generous tip. And just like that, B's fear grew tenfold. Jazz. Izuku. Why did you leave me with this ravenous lioness? Ah. Comma dot dot. Not that far away, Izuku, Kyoka and Kyotoku were enjoying a nice, relaxing drive around the city, with Jazz playing some nice, smooth, well, Jazz to accommodate the atmosphere. However, the Jiro Patriarch's curiosity got the better of him and he peered into the rearview mirror, specifically at Izuku. So, Midoriya, what exactly is this hero exhibit about? Hey yeah, good point. Kyoka added, turning to her best friend curiously. You said it was about the dawn of heroes, but what exactly are we in for? Just like that, Izuku's eyes were shining brightly, eager to talk about his interests. Oh man, Kyoka, you guys are gonna love it. 
It's gonna be all about the heroes who took a stand before there were any formal systems or regulations for heroes. If not for these individuals, the world we know today may not even be the same. He puffed air from his nose in anticipation. As far as I'm concerned, this exhibit is well worth turning down a day at a theme park. Uh-huh. Kyoko leered at the greenette with a cheeky grin. Just make sure you don't let Iida know you said that. Oh, sorry. Izuku bowed his head shamefully. I really shouldn't speak badly about Ida's offer, should I? I already feel guilty enough turning him down. Ah, I wouldn't worry too much about it, Zuku. Jazz piped up. Everyone's got their own interests, after all. Kyotoku nodded in agreement. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, I'm impressed by your dedication to hero knowledge, Midoriya. You obviously know your stuff. Ha, huh, no wonder you got into UA. Izuku laughed bashfully at the compliment, though he also recognized that it was some genuine praise from his best friend's dad. I'd better not let that go to waste. Right as he was about to reply, though, something caught his eye out the window, making him do a double take. H huh, wait, is that? Hmm. Kyoko leaned over across Izuku to see what he found, and her eyes widened angrily at the sight of a certain spiky blonde head of hair. Gah, crap, seriously. Whirling around, Kyotoku asked, what? What's the matter? Freaking Bakugo. Kyoka pounded her hand against the seat. Gah, even when we're out of school, we still run into that guy. Well, yeah, he and I live in the same neighborhood. Izuku pointed out. That's besides the point. Jazz, drive faster. But the Autobot lieutenant wasn't about to have it. Nah ah, Kyo. Gotta obey the speed limit. If the kid notices us, then y'all are gonna have to handle it yourselves. A groan escaped Kyoka's throat, but to her dismay, that was just loud enough for Bakugo to perk his head up and look to his left. Ha, huh, Deku. He shouted. And if that weren't enough, a red light popped up right at that moment, bringing Jazz to a full stop. What the hell are you doing here? Crap. Kyoka seethed. Seeing no other option, Izuku rolled down the window and gave a shaky wave. You uh, hi, Kachan. Wasn't expecting to see you. Damn it, Deku. Katsuki spat as he stormed up to the window. Who the hell said you could run into me? S sorry, I, um, I mean we were just headed to the nearby hero exhibit. Izuku craned his head back to the two Jiros. Kiyotoku shot the explosive blonde a grin and a small salute while Kyoka flipped him off out of her father's view. Kyoka and her dad are giving me a lift. Gur, of course you'd be going with him, ears. Kyoka scowled right back at the bully, sticking her chin out at him. Yeah, well just where are you going, bombs for brains. Turning around, Kyotoku berated his daughter. Hey, hey, is that how you talk to all your classmates? He offered an apologetic smile to the young man. Sorry about my daughter, kid, she can be a bit prone to conflict sometimes. So, where are you off to? Can we give y'all a lift? Mind your own damn business, scarecrow hair. Katsuki blew the man off as he trudged back onto the sidewalk. I've got places to be and they don't involve you three. SS scarecrow hair. Kiyotoku reached up to his long locks of graying dark blonde hair, stroking them self-consciously. M my hair doesn't look like straw, does it? His daughter denied the claim instantly. What? No. Of course not. Internally, however, it's more like the cowardly lion's mane, but whatever. She shook that thought away and instead leaned over Izuku to give Bakugo a piece of her mind. Oh yeah. Well, we didn't wanna have you in here anyway. Knowing you, you'd just blow the seat up. Izuku tried calming the situation, though. K Kyoka, please. We're gonna cause a scene. He himself put his head out the window, offering the bully a friendly grin. Uh, so, Kachan, I heard your mom and my mom are gonna be meeting up today. That's pretty cool, right? I don't think they've seen each other in person for almost two years now. Bakugo merely rolled his eyes, clearly disinterested. Yeah, I heard the old hag talking about that. But hey, if hanging out with Auntie Inko keeps her out of my hair, then fine by me. Auntie Inko. Kyoko was utterly bewildered by that. Even after bullying Izuku to the point of trauma, he still had the nerve to consider Inko his, auntie. Thankfully, the light had since turned green and Jazz was about to pull away, much to all of their relief. Hey, Deku. All of a sudden, Bakugo called out, taking them off guard. Gladya talked some sense into lizard lips. 
Now maybe she'll take things seriously when we go head to head next time. Ah, you're welcome. Izuku replied in confusion. Er damn right I am. Everyone sighed as they left Katsuki behind, the blonde shaking his fist as if he were victorious. Comma dot dot. While the exasperated Izuku and Kyoko were now well on their way to the hero exhibition, Tenya Iida was, putting on a headband with grey elephant ears. Perfect weather for a day at the theme park. He declared as he peered over at his guests. Wouldn't you three agree? Next to him were, of course, Denki Kaminari and Ibarra Shiyazaki, the two being the winners of the small tournament they'd held for the tickets. The electric blonde was wearing a headband with brown bear ears while the vine user wore a pair of white bunny ears. SNRK, why yeah, I'd say so. Denki gave a thumbs up, trying to hold in his laughter at the sight of elephant ear Ida. Indeed, such a bright and sunny day. Abara lifted her head and closed her eyes, as if basking in the ethereal glow of the sun. The Lord has truly blessed us with fine weather for our excursion. She opened her eyes and glanced to her left, where their fourth guest was standing a bit off to the side. What about you? Are you enjoying the weather? In contrast to the sunny atmosphere, though, Fumikage Tokiami was anything but bright. His dark attire of baggy, black pants, grey hoodie and matching sneakers was one thing, but the black feathers of his raven-like head was what brought his bleak appearance altogether. The only bright spots on him were his yellow beak, and the brown monkey ears he had on his headband. They were rather surprised when he expressed interest in coming to the theme park, Zoo Dreamland, at all, but nevertheless, Tenya was more than happy to invite him. I suppose, but, Tokiami replied, only to raise a brow at Tenya. President, are these accessories really necessary? Not necessary, per se, but embracing the park's theme is sure to make the experience all the more delightful. Tenya assured with a beaming grin. We became, wild, inhabitants of Zoo Dreamland the moment we stepped through the gates. Besides, I'd say that the families who've come today are also enjoying the headbands, wouldn't you? True, there were several families around who were all wearing animal ears, though that didn't stop Tokiami from fiddling with his. The shape of his head didn't necessarily lend well to headbands, after all. Still, his class president's passion was hard to deny. If that's how it is. Yeah, and besides, Kaminari straightened his own ears out. I think I make these look good. Abara felt her lips curl at the blonde's behavior, leading her to cover her mouth and try to hide it. It's certainly quite the fashion statement, HMHM, however, her giggle had caught Denki's attention and they locked eyes, only for them both to bashfully turn away, both trying to hide their blushes. S so, um, where do we start? An excellent question. Tenya reached into his back pocket and pulled out a map of the park, intent on being as efficient with this visit as possible. By the day's end, I hope to conquer every last ride and attraction, so we'd better be effective in the order we go in. Both Abara and Denki deadpanned at the class president's statement, knowing that might not be possible. Oh boy, here we go, the electrification user facepalmed, only for an idea to spring into his head. Hey, Shiyazaki, he whispered, catching the young lady's attention with an excited smirk. Wanna make up an excuse and take on the park in our own order? The vine-haired girl stared at Denki disbelievingly. Kaminari, are you suggesting that we just ditch Iida? Well, we could do that and actually have fun, or we could have every single step we take dictated by Mr. Stickler over there. Denki's gaze became more determined. So, what do you say? Wanna have an adventure? As much as Abara wasn't keen on leaving the other two behind, she had to admit, the resolve behind Denki's gaze and voice was, enticing to her. Why am I getting so excited? A and why does my chest feel tight? Am I having a heart attack? After taking a few silent breaths to calm herself, she steeled her nerve and returned the blonde's gusto. Oh okay. I'm in. Awesome. Now, watch and learn, approaching Tenya from behind, Denki cleared his throat and spoke up to him. Yo, Prez. There, ah, uh, there's actually something that Shiyazaki and I wanted to see. Once again, there it was, the tight feeling in her chest. W.Y. did he word it like that? Still, there was no going back now, so she had to play along. Why yes. Over in the savanna zone, they're having a botanical display that features several African plants. I was hoping to catch it today, so. A botanical event, you say? Ieda asked, clearly intrigued as he searched the map. 
Then we ought to begin there. But both Denki and Ibarra shook their heads. D don't sweat it, we'll just split up, the former insisted. Yes, Kaminari and myself, you and Tokiami. Ibarra added, in this way, we'll be able to cover more ground quicker. Hmm, Tenya hummed in suspicion, narrowing his eyes at their overly eager smiles. After we decided to come here together. Well, yeah, but you won't get to conquer every ride if you're babysitting us all day. Denki countered, which Abara nodded fervently at. And they'll probably sell out of that exclusive apple pie that Tokiami wanted. As if on cue, Fumikage opened his eye with a sharp glare. That was the whole reason he'd come in the first place, after all. That would be disappointing, he murmured. They'd better not sell out by the time we get there. Once again, Tenya hummed, though this time it was more in consideration. Hmm, you do make a good point. And just like that, the seed of doubt had been planted, wherein Denki gave one final push. Great, so we'll meet back up at lunch, K. Okay. Farewell for now. Abara waved as she and Denki rushed off in the opposite direction before Tenya could say anything else. Wait, I, ah, uh, never mind. They're too far gone now. The president of class 1A placed his hands on his hips. They certainly want to attend that botanical event, don't they? Tokiami, though, was a bit more skeptical. Shiyazaki, I would believe wanting to attend. But given what I've observed of Kaminari's behavior, I wouldn't be surprised if he took this as a good opportunity to flirt with her. And just like that, Tenya realized that he'd been had. Gah, I should have known. His head sulked low, though only briefly as he pushed his resolve back to the forefront. Well, what's done is done. If anything, I should probably be thankful that Kaminari has been smitten by a proper young lady such as Ibarra rather than some untrustworthy witch. You recover fast. Also, please be mindful. We are in public, after all. Ah, right, apologies. Just then, though, the spectacled boy remembered something incredibly important. Oh, that's right, your apple pie. He pulled the map up and began searching. The exclusive treat is available, here, at Forest Suites. Then let's go. Thankfully, it didn't take the duo long to find the establishment, Tenya having walked with confidence as he followed the map exactly. Once they arrived, they ordered their apple pies and took a seat, with Tokiami wasting no time in biting into his coveted sweet. Um, good. He stated simply. Tenya, though, was much less brief in his assessment of the food. Um, indeed. The cinnamon brings out the apple sweetness while preserving the refreshing acidity. And the pie crust meshes perfectly with the baked apple's softened texture, quite delicious. All Tokiami did was nod in agreement as he took another bite, his beak leaving pointed indents in the dessert. We ought to tell Kaminari and Shiyazaki about this later. It'd be a shame if they missed out on something so good. But Tokiami, I have to say, I had no idea you loved apples so much. After swallowing his bite, the bird-headed boy opened his eyes to reply. They claim the nutrition found in a single apple, if eaten daily, is enough to eliminate visits to the doctor, you know. The statement made Tenya blink incredulously, but Tokiami continued on. Plus, there's that perfect combination of sweet and tart. And they can be preserved for long periods of time, there's no fruit more perfect than an apple. Tenya could only give a single nod as they continued eating their fill. But you prefer oranges, don't you, President? It was then that the spectacled boy noticed Tokiami glancing at his orange juice, to which he explained, not exactly. Rather, their juice is like gasoline for my quirk. So I never pass up the chance to drink some. You never know when I might need to spring into action, after all. After that clarification, the boys finished their pies and began roaming around once more. Now, where to next? Any rides you're interested in, Tokiami? Not exactly. It's up to you, President. Very well, spreading the map out, Tenya took a glance over it to see their nearest options, and he quickly found the perfect one. Ah, I know just the thing, then. The thing, as Tokiami would soon find out, was the teacup ride, which was located near a bunch of modern art pieces. A massive tire, a giant melon bread, a pyramid and a giant red sphere occupied the space around the attraction, much to their astonishment. What a bizarre place. Adjusting his glasses, Iida agreed with his classmate's assessment. Yes, I understand the park director is a patron of the arts. These temporary installations have been around for years now. 
Moving past the modern art, the boys reached the teacup ride, which Tokiami was utterly baffled by. What am I looking at? Oasis Tea Time, they call it. The first essential stop during any visit to the park. Tenya pointed out the current lack of patrons. In no line, this is our chance, Tokiami. Racing for a cup, Tenya fell into the seat and his bird-headed friend followed suit, all while noting the only other riders were parents with small children. Once he was seated, Fumikage quickly noted the giant circular piece in the middle of their cup. What does this handle do, President? The faster we spin this, the faster the teacup rotates. Is, that's something we want. Tenya gave a single nod. Yes, oh, it's starting. What would happen next was something that the young hero in training could not have been prepared for. The very second the ride began to move, Tokiami grabbed the center handle and cranked it as fast as he could, which only made things even faster for Tenya. He almost thought he'd be sent flying with the amount of centripetal force alone if he wasn't clinging for dear life. T. Tokiami. What are you doing? Tokiami's reply was all but baffling. The goal of this ride is to spin the teacup, right? I would say we're winning. The class president of 1A wanted so badly to say it doesn't work that way, but if he was afraid that he'd lose his lunch if he opened his mouth anymore. He could practically feel the orange juice and apple pie threatening to leave his stomach. Once the ride was over, though, both boys were left slumped on a nearby bench, breathing hard after the experience. Th that, wasn't, a competition, Tenya finally said. You, should've, said that sooner. Tokiami heaved. This really must be your first time at a theme park. I have no reason to lie. Shaking his head, Fumikage sought to get back on track. So, what comes next, President? You did say you wanted to conquer every attraction, yes. Once Tenya regained his bearings, he took in a deep breath, focusing back on his goal. Yes, of course, in that case, though, how about something a bit more relaxing? He pointed across the way, to a rather gaudy merry-go-round, one that had various different animals in addition to horses. Tenya would end up taking one of said horses while Tokiami went with a rhino, and just like that, they were off on a leisurely spin, all while a bunch of parents recorded their little kids having much more fun than they were. Fumikage raised a skeptical brow at the activity. How exactly is this fun, President? You can't tell, Tokiami. These are animals one normally wouldn't get to ride, but here, it's perfectly safe. Tenya then pointed out the happy children. You see, the kids seem to be enjoying it. I suppose, though why do most of these rides involve spinning? That's not all there is. Some also move up and down while rotating. So more spinning. Comma dot dot. As Tokiami was slightly regretting his decision to come, a certain pair had just gone for a spin themselves, a much more exciting spin at that. Wobbling their way through the exit for the cheetah coaster, came Denki and Ibarra, the duo still feeling the rush after their experience. Ha ha ha. Woo. Denki threw his hands into the air as if he were still on the ride. See, I told ya that'd be awesome. That, that was thrilling. It had been the first time that Ibarra went on a coaster that had actual loops, and she had to admit, she ended up loving the experience. Ha, huh, and here I was thinking I was going to be sick to my stomach. Once they shuffled their way to the nearest bench, the duo sat down and Denki let out a sigh. Ha, huh, well, if we'd gone to get those apple pies first, then we probably would've. He shot Ibarra a wink without even thinking. So, glad we decided to pair off now. All at once, the Vine user's dizziness was forgotten about, the blood rushing back to her head as her face grew a soft shade of pink. Oh oh, well, she scratched her cheek timidly. I suppose, though I still don't think it was the nicest thing to do. Denki conceded with a shrug. Yeah, not exactly the best move, but hey, we had fun, right? He reclined back, trying to relax himself after the ride. So, what next? Anything you wanna actually go see? I'm not certain, Abara reached into the pocket of her jeans and pulled out a map she'd procured. Let me see. As she studied the map, Denki's eyes drifted toward her, and just like that, he was enraptured by every single detail about the girl sitting next to him. He had admitted to himself a while ago that there was something different about this crush compared to the multiple ones he'd had in the past. Sure, there were lots of pretty girls out there, even some going about their day at this very theme park, Yet somehow, Abara's saintly beauty eclipsed all of them. Is this what it's like when it's more than just a random crush? 
He wondered. You uh, hey, Shiazaki. Hem. Abara perked up from the map, offering a small smile. Yes. Denki nearly lost his voice there and then, but he proceeded. Uh, well, hey, call me crazy, and this may just be the blood rushing back to my head, but, outside of hanging out at Autobot base after school, we haven't really interacted much, have we? Does the sports festival not count? That's where we properly met, though. Denki pointed out with a slight chuckle. And trust me, I'll always remember that. Hee <laughs> hee, I've still got the puncture points. Apparently, that was the wrong thing to say since Abara immediately panicked. A.H. I'm so sorry. She bowed profusely several times. I I was just doing what I had to in order to win, I didn't mean to. Whoa, whoa, no need for apologies. Denki assured with a frantic wave before offering a small smile. Trust me, I get it. I was going all out too, you know. Hearing this, Abara took a deep breath, attempting to control her flustered state. All right, of course, so, um, was there something you wanted to talk about? Denki merely shrugged. Well, not anything specific. I just thought it'd be cool for us to, I dunno, get to know each other better. I mean, we see each other almost every day now and the rest of our friends are already getting along pretty well. The electrification user counted on his fingers. Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu are buds, Kendo and Uraraka are neighbors of all things, and I'm convinced that Tokage and Ishido are scheming to get into trouble as we speak. That managed to get Abara to giggle a little, covering her mouth in the process. HM HM, I would not put that past them. Well, alright then, what is it that you'd like to know? How about we start with the basics? Why do you want to be a hero? Hmm, that's a good start, indeed. After collecting her thoughts, the Vine user lifted her head and basked in the sun's glow again. I suppose, it has much to do with my faith, if I'm to be completely honest with you. Denki blinked in surprise. Whoa, really? Yes, growing up reading the Bible, I was always enamored with the exploits of those within. They were seen as saviors of the people in times of great travesty and uncertainty. She reached up and clenched her hand over her chest. And eventually, I thought, if I could harness my quirk's power for virtuous acts, then perhaps I could be someone's savior as well. Her explanation left Denki speechless. Her ambitions were incredibly altruistic, and it made him admire her all the more. Whoa, that's honestly really awesome. He nodded in approval. Well, I hope that you're able to fulfill those ambitions, Shiazaki. Abara's features brightened up, accented by the sun's warm glow. Oh, thank you very much. But what about you, Kaminari? Why did you want to become a hero? Err, well, about that, Denki rubbed his neck as a grimace took over his face. His companion's gaze became once of concern, prompting him to start his story. Ya see, growing up, I wasn't exactly seen as a very smart kid. I got passing grades and all, but only barely. I'm thankful that my parents understood that I wasn't the quickest learner, but that didn't stop the teachers and other students from doubting me. Oh, Kaminari, that's awful. You, weren't beat up, were you? Ah, and no, not really. Ironically, no one wanted to mess with me because they knew how powerful my quirk was. Still, middle school was pretty tough. Denki's brow furrowed then and there. But I wasn't about to give up. I wanted to show them all up by getting into UA. Hi and becoming a hero. He put on a confident smirk and jerked a thumb to himself. And of all the kids from my school who applied, guess who was the only one to pass the entrance exam? Abara clapped her hands together, visibly impressed. Ha, huh, that's amazing to hear, Kaminari. Crossing his arms, Denki nodded. Hey, yeah, I studied my ass off for that exam. And of course, the robots were a piece of cake for my quirk. Still, he let out an exasperated sigh as he lowered his head a bit. Still, kinda wish the rest of the school year wasn't as hard as the entrance exam. I, didn't do so well on midterms and I'm kinda worried about finals coming up. And what's worse is that Aizawa said that those who don't pass miss out on the summer training camp. Blinking a couple times, Abara took the information in. Oh dear, but the very next second, she let out a gasp as an idea popped into her head. A.H. Kaminari. H. Huh. Please, allow me to help you in your studies. Denki did a double take at the sudden offer. H. Huh. Are you serious? Of course. Abara clenched her fists with purpose. 
I would be remiss if I allow one of my peers to fall behind. And helping someone in times of great need is part of what being a hero is all about. So, consider yourself being helped. No way, you'd do that for me. Receiving a single nod from the young lady, Denki was overcome with emotion. Not just because she was willing to help him, but because in that moment, her beauty shined like never before, her fortitude practically etched across her features. Th thank you so much, Shiyazaki. I promise to repay you one day. He exclaimed, trying and failing to hide his tears. But then, at that moment, excuse me. The duo's heads perked up and Denki quit the waterworks, their eyes darting around at the sudden yet small voice that spoke up to them. Down here, Denki and Ibarra brought their sights front and downward, where they saw a little girl in a cute orange and white Sunday dress, her black hair in a bob cut with a headband that had a giraffe's horns and ears on it, and she was all by herself. Oh boy, comma dot dot. So, you two discovered this lost child, hm? Tenya questioned, glancing down to the tiny girl. And Yuka's her name, right? After a quick call from Denki, the quartet of UA students all met up at the rendezvous point. Clearly, this was an emergency. However, with a small yet adorable pout, Yuka denied the accusation. I'm not lost. Big girls in kindergarten don't get lost. She puffed out her chest and folded her arms, explaining, I came to the park with mommy, but then mommy went to buy lunch and I saw Jira the giraffe pass by. I went to go see him and then I couldn't find my way back. Hard to argue with that. Denki shrugged, and she doesn't want us bringing her to the lost child center. Yuka stamped her foot and puffed out her cheeks. That's cuz I'm not a lost child, mister. I just dunno where I'm supposed to meet my mommy. Tokiami was a bit blunter. Right, you are literally a lost child. His point only made Yuka shrink back, hiding behind Denki's leg. Whoa, you're kinda giving our Tokiami the cold shoulder. Kneeling down, Denki gave her a reassuring pat on the shoulder. There's nothing to be scared of about him, ya know. Bee birds are scary. Yuka stammered. One time, one ate my bread and bit me. Abara was having trouble containing herself. This little one was just too cute and innocent for words. Still, she felt the need to reassure her, so she did. Ahem, Yuka, sweetie, Tokiami isn't a bird. He just looks that way because of his quirk. His quirk. Yuka was still clearly scared, but a bit more curious as she glanced at Tokiami. The young lady offered a relaxing smile to the girl. But I understand why you must be frightened. Believe me, I've had birds peck at my head from time to time, too. She extended a hand toward the bird-headed boy. But Tokiami here is an absolute gentleman. You have nothing to fear. While Abara's words of encouragement helped relax Yuka a little, Tokiami could still see her frightened state, and he sighed. Ha, huh, psychological scars don't heal that easily. Anyhow, her mother is probably worried about her. Indeed. Tenya nodded steadfastly. We ought to bring her to the designated meeting spot at once. He craned his head down to meet Yuka's eyes. Now, where were you supposed to meet in case you got lost, Yuka? In front of the apple. The girl answered. That didn't exactly help clear things up, though. The apple. Near where they're selling apple pies maybe. Tenya guessed. I recall seeing apple decorations near forest suites, so perhaps we should head back there. As it happened, though, that wouldn't be the case. Because the moment they arrived at the sweets shop, the little girl frowned. This where she told you to find her, Yuka? Denki asked. No, not here. A way bigger apple, like, these big. The little girl stretched her arms out as far as she could for emphasis. Tapping her chin, Abara thought of what sort of apple could be that size at the theme park. Iida, do you know of any bigger apples around here? I frequented Zoo Dreamland as a child, but no, I don't recall any giant apples. Lifting the map, Tenya began scanning his eyes across it, but again, no dice. And there's nothing on the map that indicates one either. What happened next made everyone's blood run cold. I'm, never gonna see mommy again. The group whipped their heads down and saw Yuka on the verge of tears, which made Denki and Abara jump into high gear to make sure she didn't cry. W we didn't imply that, honest. The latter asserted. Darn it all, what kind of heroes in training are we? Bringing a little girl to tears, unacceptable. But that's when Denki got an idea. I know, maybe we could spot this apple from somewhere up high. 
The blonde whipped a finger up toward the tallest attraction the park had to offer. Like the Ferris wheel. Another one that spins, Tokiami remarked. Still, the spinning didn't stop them from heading on, and within minutes, they were up a fair distance. Yuka, take a good look and try to find your meetup spot. Abara directed. Okay. As the pod rose higher and higher, all of their eyes were glued to their windows, scanning the entire park. Man, Hatsume's quirk would come in real handy right now. Denki lamented. She'd zoom in with her eyes and we'd be able to find that apple in seconds. My electrification quirk ain't much use here. Hem, neither is mine. Tenya hummed regrettably. Yuka tilted her head toward the young man. What's your quirk, Mr. Glasses? It's engine, and it allows me to run quickly. Tenya lifted his pant leg, showing off the engines built into them. Oh, cool. I don't have my quirk yet, Yuka said, appearing dejected. Abara reached over, once again patting the girl's shoulder in reassurance. Oh, Yuka, don't be discouraged. You're at that age where your quirk is bound to show itself. That managed to spark a flicker of hope in the little girl. Really? Giving a thumbs up, Denki reinforced the encouragement. Sure will. You'll find out what it is before you know it. Seeing that the kindergartner was now fully reinvigorated, he continued his search for the apple. Now, just gotta find your mom. Indeed, though if we cannot locate it, I believe it'd be prudent to take little Yuka to the lost child center. Tenya suggested. But there was no announcement, though. Yuka argued, struggling to pronounce the big word. So that means mommy didn't go there yet. Her point gave the class president pause. Hmm, I suppose you're right. But even up here, I cannot see any giant apples. However, Yuka raised a finger, matter of factually stating, remember, if it's round, red and shiny, it's an apple. Round, red, and shiny. Tokiami repeated to himself, coming to a realization. So we could be searching for anything that fits the category of apple in the mind of a child. Our objective might be simply a round object that doesn't look exactly like an apple. Realizing that they'd likely been on a wild goose chase, the other teens all fell right in the middle of their pod. Great, well, time to head down. Denki muttered. Once they reached the bottom and disembarked the ferris wheel, they regrouped and reassessed their situation. Okay, so big, red and round. Anyone seen anything like that in the park? Actually, yes, Tokiami affirmed. This way. Without another word, the bird boy raced off, much to Yuka's confusion. Still, the group managed to keep up with him until they made it back to the forest zone where the modern art pieces stood near the teacup ride. Right in the middle was a giant, red sphere, and sure enough, standing next to it was a rather anxious woman with black hair. Is that your apple, Yuka? The little girl's eyes lit up immediately. Yes, mommy, over here. A gasp escaped the woman's throat as she rushed straight over to the teens, scooping her daughter up in a relieved embrace. A.H. Yuka, where were you? Mommy was worried half to death. About that, ma'am, Abara started, providing an explanation for the past 20 minutes of their search. Of course, the woman bowed profusely, offering several apologies and thanks. But Abara dismissed them with a shake of her head. It's quite alright. We only did what was right. She craned her head down and pat Yuka on the head. No getting lost again, okay, Yuka. Yes, say, thank you, Yuka. The mother added with a smile. Hem. The little girl nodded. Thank you. As the mother and daughter began to walk away, though, Yuka spun around suddenly and raced back toward Tokiami. Oh. M. Mr. Bird. Tokiami tilted his head. What is it? Um, sorry for getting scared of you. You're way bigger than that other bitey bird, so I thought you were gonna eat me with that big beak. Her words made everyone chuckle, Tokiami included. HMHM, you've no cause to worry about that. Because my favorite food is apples. Yuka brightened up hearing that. Ah, mine too. See you later. With that, the girl and her mother were off, leaving the teens feeling quite satisfied. Ah, all's well that ends well, I say. Tenya resolved. Yep, now we can enjoy the rest of our day at the park. Denki declared. How's about we go get some lunch, EH? The quartet all agreed on that and went off, unaware that the day's challenges at Zoo Dreamland were only just beginning. Comma dot dot. Back with Izuku and Kyoka, the two had just come out of the exhibition center, both quite satisfied with their experience at the event. 
Granted, Kyoko wasn't too big on the exclusive items, so she let Izuku keep the ones she was given, which only made him all the happier. Kyoko herself was just happy with what she saw at the exhibition, because not only did she get to learn about some of the earliest heroes in the Age of Quirks, but she also learned about heroes from even earlier than that. Because, to her and Izuku's astonishment, there was an entire display dedicated to a certain team that they'd become quite familiar with. That was so cool. I seriously can't believe that G.I. Joe had their own exhibit here, the punk rocker commented. Me either. I mean, I guess it makes sense since they weren't a secret back then. Izuku recalled, I think I remember Duke saying something about the Joes being more public figures back before Quirks became the norm. He sent her a curious glance. Who was your favorite? I liked learning about General Joe Colton himself, personally. He seemed like an admirable man. Kyoka gave a shrug. Yeah, he was cool, but honestly. She raised her fists with a wily smirk, punching the air in front of her. I think my favorite had to be Sergeant. Slaughter. Dude served with the Joes and was a professional wrestler. That just sounds so cool. Izuku nodded wholeheartedly. Oh yeah, and the fact that he was apparently unbeatable on the battlefield. That's amazing to think about. Just then, the front door opened behind them once again and Kyotoku came walking out, with his hands full of exclusive merchandise. Haha. Ha. Man, am I glad I tagged along with you kids. Picking up some exclusive merch is always a treat on these kinds of trips. You, Kyoka cringed at the sight of her father, especially since he was wearing a hat with the visage of one of the lamer superheroes they'd learned about, Turboman. Dad, could ya kindly hurry it up and put that in Jazz's trunk, please? Before someone sees you. Ah, don't get into a tizzy, hun, I'm. Come on, it's gonna start any minute. Oh my gosh, it's finally opening. All of a sudden, a mob of people came charging in from seemingly out of nowhere, plowing their way past the unexpecting trio. Izuku and Kyoka shouted in terror as they were pushed down while Kyotoku yelled in pain as he was buried under all his merchandise. Once the crowd had moved away, the two teens managed to pick themselves up off the ground, and irate Kyoka screaming after the mob, Hey! Watch where you're going! Shaking his head, Izuku couldn't help but wonder what that was all about. Man, talk about crazy. Where do you think they were headed? He peered down to Kyotoku, who was trying to rummage his way out of his predicament. M. Mr. Jiro, do you need help? N. No. I'm all good. Thrusting his finger out of the pile of merch, Kyotoku directed them to go. You did just follow that mob and see what the hell they're on about. I've got half a mind to sue those people for bodily harm. Please don't. Kyoka sighed as she stood up. Well, anyway, I wanna give those idiots a piece of my mind, too, so we might as well. On that note, the two teens jogged after the massive group of people, following them several blocks down the street. When they managed to catch up, they saw the large group join an even bigger crowd that was gathered in front of, in front of, whoa, what the hell. Izuku couldn't believe his eyes. The crowd they had been nearly trampled by were all piling into a massive convention center, one that was hosting, of all things, a common writer themed event. But this wasn't just any event, if the large sign over the main entrance was anything to go by. Common Rider the convention, celebrating 200 years of masked heroism. The circular building's windows were decorated with banners that depicted a slew of different riders. From the Showa era, to Heisei, to Reiwa and beyond. And atop the convention center's roof, a statue of common rider Ichigo doing his signature pose was on prominent display. But what Izuku and Kyoka were flabbergasted at most of all was the staggering amount people were in attendance for the event. It easily dwarfed the hero exhibition they were just at, and not just because it was in a bigger venue. There was only one question lingering with them, though. How the hell did we miss this? Kyoka exclaimed. I genuinely have no idea. Izuku placed a hand on his head. Did we pass this on the way here? Kyoka shook her head. No, I don't think we came this way, honestly. She furrowed her brow skeptically and crossed her arms. But man, what the heck? How is it that things always seem to lead back to Kamen Rider with us? First your costume and now this. I swear, it's like the universe is trying to tell us something. She began searching around the immediate area. We aren't being watched, right? Are we on candid camera? Izuku wore a wincing smile at her comment, doubting that was the case. 
I I wouldn't go that far. It's probably all just one big coincidence. All the same, the greenette set his eyes on the convention with intrigue. You wanna try getting in? E.H., why not? Kyoka grinned. There's still a lot of daylight left. With that, the duo raced toward the entryway, eager to get passes into the event. But, little did either of them know that they were, in fact, being watched. Around the corner, coming seemingly from out of nowhere, a tall, slender, yet masculine figure strolled out and watched the two friends as they closed in on the convention center. He was quite the handsome fellow with his dark hair neatly combed, wearing an all-black suit with a white undershirt and gold tie, his white and red scarf serving as an extra splash of color. With a glint in his eye and a sly grin on his face, he snapped his fingers and pointed at the teens, knowing that now was the right time to make his move. I finally have you right where I want you, Izuku Midoriya. And it's the end of season 2 part 38 of this what if, I hope you guys like it, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel.